One. We are live now. One. Uh, welcome all the viewers on the behalf of Vice Zone of the Indian Orthopedic Association. This Vice Zone is form of the uh, Gujarat, Maharashtra and Goa, these three states. And it has formed recently. And uh, there are tremendous activities we are going on under the West Zone. And uh, um, this is the, now the third session of uh, West Zone Academics, which we are give, uh, doing every Sunday, every evening. And we are taking different themes. Now, the theme for the, this particular week is on the hands. And Dr. Ashok Ghorke, who is a very dynamic uh, secretary from uh, New Mumbai, and uh, probably he'll be the, our executive committee member for Maharashtra Fabric Association also. And uh, his, uh, he has uh, chalked out a very wonderful program. The basic idea of this is uh, because uh, this was the only zone to be formed in all over India. West zone was a little lagging. The attempts were made in 1996, but somehow the things did not uh, went further. And this time with the uh, initiative of Dr. Ajit Shinde, as well as Dr. Navin Thakkar, and uh, President of the Gujarat Orthopedic Association, as well as the cooperation from the Goa Orthopedic Association, we could form this. And now uh, our aim is to reach to the every orthopedic surgeon because there are so many webinars which are, uh, you can say, uh, there is a spurt of the webinars, but the webinars which are helpful for every orthopedic surgeon, practicing orthopedic surgeon is in day-to-day -day OPD, and even the remote orthopedic surgeon is day-to-day -day OPD. Those subjects we are taking up, and uh, accordingly, we have started this. So I welcome the dignitaries from all over, and we are going to do today we are webinars in the hand, and uh, there will be all the basic things in the hand will be discussed today. So. I uh, hand over, I, I welcome all the dignitaries as well as the uh, viewers and I thank Ortho TV for their incessant and regular and continuous support and uh, they, they, I will say now in the past I was used to say they are the one of the best in India but now they are one of the best in world and they are doing so many webinars and also without any hitch so I thank Ortho TV also Niraj Bijalani and Ashok Sham and his team and I hand over the um, uh, proceedings to Dr. Ashok. Dr. Ashok. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Karane sir. So, <clears throat> I first of all uh, thank Indian Orthopedic Association uh, West Zone, uh, West Zone IOA that is called. So, uh, we uh, this is like last month we had on office orthopedics and uh, uh, this Sunday, including next two Sundays, we will be having on hand and uh, uh, this time we are having hand procedures in outpatients. So I thank West Zone IOA first of all, and uh, uh, I also thank all the dignitaries, uh, 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 Dr. Anil Bhatt sir, uh, uh, Dr. Ajit Tiwari, Abhijit Vahegavkar, Dr. Karan Maheshwari, Dr. Uh, Karne sir for, for joining here and sharing the podium. So uh, the, the theme today is hand procedures in outpatients. So we have so many sort of uh, trigger finger, very, very common conditions and uh, which can be done as an OPD procedure, even in the minor OT under local anesthesia. So uh, the first talk for today was by Dr. Prashan, but he will be joining. He had just informed me. So I, I request uh, Dr. Karn Maheshwari. He is a, he's a hand surgeon from Ahmedabad. So he will be talking on radiology and anesthesia in hand. Uh, Dr. Kurt, please yes, sir. share your screen. Okay, sir. Okay, so the screen is visible now. Ashok, sir? Yes, yes, it is visible. Oh, okay, okay. okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Today, uh, I'll uh, start the talk with radiology and anesthesia, volant in hand. I am Dr. Karna Maheshwari, a hand surgeon from Ahmedabad. So today, I will start the talk with one case. This is 25-year-old male, had a cricket ball injury while catching the ball. And uh, he was unable to extend the DIP joint of little finger. When we took the x-ray, uh, hand AP view, oblique view, it was like this. But when we took lateral x-ray, we could find that it, 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 he had a mallet injury. So in any finger injury, lateral x-ray is must. Uh, we find some uh, 
this, uh, this is a lateral X-ray of the particular patient, and we found that he had mallet injury. This is a similar case. Uh, patient had cricket ball injury. We took AP and oblique X-ray of hand, but in this case, uh, this particular X-rays we could not find any injury. But when we took a lateral X-ray of particular finger, we found that he had a PIP fracture dislocation with such a significant uh, fragment. So in any finger injury, lateral X-ray is must. First lesson is. Lateral X-ray is must in any finger injury. Uh, now we'll forward. We'll move forward to wrist joint PA view. In wrist, we should take a PA view rather than AP view. How to take P, uh, posterior anterior view? Uh, we should keep uh, elbow, uh, shoulder abducted to 90 degree, elbow flexed to 90 degree, and we should place the wrist over the X-ray plates, uh, like shown in the picture. Uh, how will we, how can we identify that this is a proper PA view? So for that, we should know that uh, in proper PA view, groove for the ECU is radial to the ulnar styloid. And after taking, by taking PA view, we can, we, uh, there won't be any overlapping in distal radio ulnar joint. There will be minimal overlapping of metacarpal basis. The gilula's line will be, uh, will be smooth and articulating bones means uh, scaphoid and lunate and lunate and trichoidrum will be parallel to each other with 2 mm gap. So as I have mentioned, normal wrist PA and lateral views consist of gilulas arc as shown in the first picture. There are three gilulas arc parallel to each other. There are a, a rule, rule of parallelism means scaphoid and lunate and lunate at triquetrum articulating surface will be parallel to each other. Radius, lunate and metacarpal, uh, uh, radius and lunate will be, axis will be in one line, whereas metacarpal, third metacarpal line will be parallel to it. Uh, the PC form bone, a shadow of PC form bone will be between the scaphoid tuberosity and capitate head in lateral view and radio scaphoid angle will be less than 60 degree. So by knowing this wrist uh, normal radiological anatomy, we can now identify perilunate dislocation where there will be step in gilulas arc. There is a piece of pi or triangular lunate. There is capito lunate dislocation in lateral view. And there will be spilled teapot sign where lunate is volarly uh, uh, tilted. So this is a, this is a science of perilunate dislocation. L now we will move forward to third thing that is scaphoid dissociation. If we are suspecting that, then we can take a clenched pencil view where both hands are uh, uh, given a pencil and the patient is asked to clench the fist and there will be uh, the distance between scaphoid and lunate will be increased that will be more than 4 millimeter and uh, that is known as Terry Thomas or David Litterman sign uh, behind the name uh, of both the comedians from USA uh, because they have a distance in, in their front tits. Uh, this is another uh, view Robert's view for first CMC joint that is particularly true AP view for first CMC joint. By this, we can identify the conditions like first CMC joint osteoarthritis, Bennett's fracture, or Rolando fracture pattern. This is another view, Breverton view for metacarpal head fractures. Here we can we should keep the hand or metacarpal at 60 degree, and we have to keep the uh, proximal phalanx dorsum on the X-ray plate, and the uh, uh, X-ray beam will be slightly ulnar to radial, 15 degree ulnar to radial. Then these are certain avulsion injuries in hand, which are apparently very small, uh, but they ultimately need a surgical intervention most of the times. So here the first case is ulnar collateral ligament avulsion of thumb. The fragment size is very small, but ultimately it may end up in surgical intervention. The second uh, figure is suggestive of FDP avulsion, jersey finger, that also needs surgical intervention. Uh, the first picture here is a Bennett fracture that is also avulsion kind of injury because abductor pollicis longus tendon pulls the thumb proximally and that also needs surgical intervention. Uh, this is a proximal phalanx base avulsion injury and that also needs a intervention. So these are small avulsion injuries where fragment size are very small but they need intervention. Now moving forward to carpometacarpal dislocation, uh, we can identify them by in normal X-ray, metacarpal, uh, the axis of me all metacarpals convert to distal radius. 
but wherein uh, in carpo metacarpal dislocation they will be parallel to each other and they won't converge now uh, by calculation of ulnar variance we know ulnar variance is uh, distance between distal surface of ulna and radius if it is a negative ulnar variance then it may end up in kinbox disease or vice versa in kinbox disease we may find negative ulnar variance whereas in uh, positive ulnar variance it it may end up in ulna impaction syndrome now the most important scaphoid bone x ray in sca suspecting scaphoid fracture if we are suspecting then we should take these views uh, pa view pa with ulnar deviation that is scaphoid view then lateral view and semi pronated view uh, in proper uh, ulnar deviation scaphoid view we will identify the whole profile of scaphoid whereas in semi pronated view we can identify the fractures of uh, scaphoid tuberosity that is distal pole so these were uh, uh, main things in uh, from x ray in hand and now we'll go forward to ct scan i advise my radiologist to take ct scan in fresh scaphoid fracture and i will write him that he should comment on comminution gap and angulation and i will decide my plan accordingly ct scan in hand is useful in other paralunate dislocation uh, other pip joint fracture dislocation distal and radius fracture pattern or any comminuted fracture pattern uh, ct scan is important then for my my part ultrasound in hand i use it for mainly duocorvans rhinosynovitis other tenosynovitis and a dynamic usg is needed to uh, to understand the muscle excursion as well as muscle muscle adhesion uh, usg has therapeutic role for ultrasounded ultrasound guided injections in hand and mri is useful in old scaphoid fracture to check a proximal pole vascularity union status as well as fracture margins whether they are sclerosed or not uh, and mri is useful in ligament injuries in soft tissue lesions like ganglion giant cell tumor glomus tumor to check its extent uh, ulnar collateral ligament injury as well as in avascular necrosis non traumatic avn of uh, lunate as well as scaphoid uh, to complete the topic i will end up with a ct arthrogram scan in hand it is useful in tfcc tear scapholunate ligament or lunotricotral ligament injury to understand the status of cartilage of bone for uh, early osteoarthritis and for scaphoid union status also so uh, the, here i complete uh, radiology part and then i now i will start with anesthesia mainly volant so volant is wide awake local anesthetic no tourniquet so uh, from the picture we can know that the person is uh, awake and the doctor um, surgeon hand surgeon is doing the surgery so volant is wide awake local anesthesia no tourniquet it is newer easier and safer option in hand surgery initially surgeries were performed in general anesthesia or regional anesthesia so like small surgeries like carpal tunnel release or dq or trigger release also needed a regional anesthesia for tourniquet to be applied on and then move, we move forward to local anesthesia with sedation but that also needed sedative agents so if we want to do surgery without sedation and under local anesthesia the volant is the option so how to prepare the solution for this uh, wide awake local anesthesia no tourniquet we need a anesthetic agent that is lignocaine 2% then normal saline then adrenaline which will act as a hemostasis and it will prolong the action of anesthetic agent and to neutralize the acidity of uh, 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 lignocaine we will add a, a sodium bicarbonate so to uh, here the solution uh, preparation is given 2% lignocaine 50 ml then ns we can add 50 ml in it and then 1 gem 1000 ratio epinephrine 1 ml we have to add and then sodium bicarbonate that is in 100 ml total solution we will add 10 ml sodium bicarbonate so the volant cocktail will be uh, will be ready of 1100 ml so how will we inject it so uh, the volume varies from 5 ml to 50 ml or more depending on the dilution or uh, depending on the duration of surgery and type of surgery it should be uh, given subcutaneously and uh, we should use 27 gauze needle and we should know that adrenaline will take at least 30 minutes for to work for hemostasis how to administer uh, area of injection is distracted by pressure or pinch uh, then when we insert the needle 
0.5 ml solution is injected and we should wait till the needle pain is gone and so the, the, the goal of whole procedure is patient should feel only 127 gauze needle pain uh, after the 0.5 ml solution and the area has become anesthetized another 2 ml injection is given before the needle is moved here we should take care there that one centimeter of palpable area of the solution should be ahead of needle our needle is at one place but the one centimeter palpable area around the needle should be there where anesthetic agent is there so uh, when uh, means the the area is anesthetized then we will withdraw the needle and we will insert the needle again in that one centimeter area so patient should not feel any pain so like in carpal tunnel syndrome this is the area uh, the, the yellow uh, blue dot is uh, 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 injection site and that is the area of administration whereas in trigger release this is the yellow uh, blue marks are suggestive of needle point and the line of administration so its indications are carpal tunnel release dupuytren's contracture trigger release uh, finger blocks in finger surgeries and metacarpal bone fractures also can be operated the contraindications are local site infection local site injury are contraindication and patient's refusal if patient is uh, very much afraid of uh, this kind of surgical environment then we should avoid this what we should instruct to patient patient should be free from any uh, scratching kind of injury in last one week that may add infection uh, he should avoid strenuous grip activity he should remove rings and uh, he should take anxiolytics if he is regularly taking it in uh, dental procedures and during surgery we should tell patient that he, he should relax hand relax his hand so the doctor can assess the things properly uh, patient should be uh, notified that uh, he should alert the doctor if any tingling or numbness in finger he uh, he feels and he uh, when he, when he is told to move the fingers he should move so what are the advantages of this uh, wide awake local anesthesia without tourniquet so it is wide awake so patient can move during the surgery so in tendon laceration tenolysis tendon transfers or dupuytren's contracture uh, the movement intraoperatively will motivate them post operatively and the recovery will be faster and we can assess the tension in the tendon uh, movement in the tendon uh, during the surgery they can position comfortably as it is local anesthesia there is no need of intravenous insertion no need of monitoring no need of routine preoperative testing or no fasting or any preoperative anesthetic visit no side effects of sedation or opioids it, it is performed in outpatient setting and it is safe with uh, medical comorbidities as there is no tourniquet patient will not have to endure unnecessary tourniquet pain even without sedation and this all in all will decrease the expense and uh, that is with uh, the sedation and so many more people can afford it so this is all about valent and uh, i will uh, in anesthesia we can include a digital nerve block we give it regularly but i will share one of my experience that is bad experience uh, i have applied a finger tourniquet with glove and ring uh, and a glove glove ring and artery forcep after giving a ring block immediately i put a, a glove ring and patient that uh, paresthesia developed but patient uh, the paresthesia sustained for 3 to 4 months in that particular finger as well as adjacent fingers it recovered fully but since then i avoid doing that and i i haven't encountered similar problem yet so don't apply finger tourniquet and ring block simultaneously in a finger surgery so the 10 take home points are lateral x-ray is must in any finger injury proper wrist pa view for better idea of radiological anatomy then for palindrome dislocation triangular lunate and step in gilula's line are the x-ray finding ct scan in fresh scaphoid and mri in old scaphoid fracture and you should keep low threshold for both the investigation clenched pencil view is for sl dissociation and roberts view is for first cmc joint understanding and pronated oblique view is for wrist scaphoid tuberosity volant is wide awake local anesthesia no tourniquet it is safer newer easier option epinephrine to achieve hemostasis and sodium bicarbonate to neutralize the acidic part of lignocaine epinephrine is safe with lignocaine for finger surgeries and don't apply finger tourniquet and ring block in finger surgery 
thank you thank you sir for giving me such a opportunity ashok sir oh, yeah I thank you dr kar it was it was a nice presentation thank uh, you sir yeah could i stop sharing yeah, please, please 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 yeah yeah so any questions to dr kar so during violent surgery uh, is it mandatory to wait for 30 minutes and for and for what reason the, as i have mentioned that it uh, like uh, epinephrine or adrenaline takes 30 minutes to work better for, for to achieve hemostasis that's why we give it and then we send patient to ot and after 30 minutes it is better to operate after 30 minutes so apart from all your indications uh, one of the best indication is when we do a surgery on the tendon i mean uh, a, a tendon repair or tendon reconstruction on table we can check whether it is having a good excursion and how the movements are so yes sir thank, yeah thank you very much very nice presentation thank you sir uh, we move on further uh, i request dr prashant kamble uh, he is a hand surgeon from mumbai and uh, and km Uh, his topic is examination of hand, Dr. Prashant. Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, all, and uh, thank you for me giving this opportunity. So I'm talking very basic uh, uh, topic: examination of hand, orientation for the resident and the new practitioner. So uh, let me share the screen. so can you see yes, uh, screen yes yes i am able to. all right so uh, here uh, today we are going to see the hand and wrist examination so for any joint uh, the systemic uh, assessment how do we go is all about the uh, inspection means the look feel move do some provocative test uh, and if add to eliminate the source of pain and to pinpoint where it is coming we can do the lignocaine injection so to do that uh, your thumb tip is your best friend right so for especially considering the uh, hand and wrist part where the tip of thumb you move you palpate everything with your tip of thumb and you will get to know what the is the source of the pain for sake of our understanding uh, we divide that Uh, and wrist pain arising from either uh, radial side or from the ulnar side by drawing a imaginary line from the center of the uh, third ray so the sources common which are extra articular coming from the ulnar side could be because of the extensor and flexor tendon and could be because of the nerves on the volar side and sometimes from the ulnar side and the intra articular or the within the joint the source could be druj coming from the ulno carpal joint or within inter carpal joint or from the intra carpal joint or sometimes through the carpo metacarpal joint as well so if you know the anatomy clearly you can pinpoint the pathology where it is coming from so identify the tender spot always start suppose patient is having the ulnar sided pain You start your examination doing from the radial side in a systemic way, which you can do. So here I am testing this patient had a radial side pain. So I've started examination from the ulnar side by tip of the thumb, and at this point at the base of the thumb, patient is complaining that pain. As you can see in the picture, that he is pointing out to the radial side of the pain, and there is a scaphoid nonunion, right? So. another thing which everyone must know because the majority of the ulnar sided wrist pain they come from the tfcc out of this the foveal and the styloid insertion if you know the anatomy clearly where it inserts at the fovea it causes the major instability uh, of the wrist so you must know that uh, proper anatomy of the triangular fibro cartilage so what are the test uh, you can do a uh, passive pronation supination druj development and druj loading so we'll see each one of them and there are multiple uh, tests as well available for the intracarpal pathology we are not going to see in much detail few of them we will see so how do we do the passive pronation and supination 
So first, take uh, the patient at the side of the table, rest the elbow, support completely, and then pure rotate the distal radiolar joint, not the intercarpal joint, because there is some uh, movement happening at the intercarpal joint, as you can see. I'm just moving passively patient's distal radiolar joint. And if the patient is no pain and he moves the pronation and supination completely, indirectly that indicates it is an intact distal radial nerve joint and there is no tear in the peripheral part of the TFCC. But coming to the DRH development, uh, when there is a foveal uh, fiber which are completely torn, the DRH is instable. So how do we test? Uh, keep the elbow supported as you can see in the video and hold the distal radial nerve joint with the thumb and the hypnar part and stable and move with the other hand. As you can see in uh, the uh, video, you can hold, do the test by stabilizing in different position. This is a neutral position, then you check in the supination, and then you again check into the pronation. In all uh, range of motion, check. So what you check is for the translation, compare that on the unaffected side, is it the same or is it uh, more than the affected side? Check for the pain or is there is there an abnormal click is happening at the site, right? So hold the DR region once at distal radial nerve joint with the one hand, move the uh, distal part of the ulna into a forward direction. So another thing uh, is the ulnocarpal ligament. Again, the cubes add to the stability of the distal radial nerve joint, and its stability is increased in full extension and radial deviation because of the tightening of the ulnocarpal ligament and the ECU floor. So when this patient had a history of fall, fall from the bike and patient is complaining that pain in the ulnar sided. And if you see that he is uh, saying that pain on the ulnar side, especially when he grips, when he drives the bike and whenever he presses, there is a pain and which makes him uncomfortable. So the test is what I see is stable the elbow, put the wrist into extension and the radial deviation. Look at the face of the patient. He's saying, yes, that, that hurts, that's painful. And you can see in the MRI also, there is the alpha ligament is completely torn. So that gives you the complete diagnosis. Another test is a DRUG loading. So DRUG joint itself becomes sometimes arthritic, either post-traumatic or rheumatoid or some inflammatory disease. So how do we do? Just squeeze the bone together, right? And well proximal to the distal radial nerve joint and varying degree of pronation and supination. So this is what you just do, just squeeze the distal radial ulnar joint in supination, pronation, patient will again have the point pain. And this was the DRUJ arthritis secondary to the inflammatory disease. Another test which uh, we commonly do in case of uh, uh, malunited distal radius or sometimes the patient have inherent leak, so relax the wrist, feel the finger, and move the wrist towards the ulnar side, as if you are grinding the carpal bone against the ulnar head, right? So see here in the video. Slowly, slowly do it in flexion and, and extension as well. Now just do and grind the carpal against the, radio, uh, the ulnar head, right? The patient will have the pain in flexion or extension that also indicates the site of pathology. So this was the MRI done. You can see there is ulnar positive variance and ulnar head is completely butting against the lunate and tracheotome area. So this patient had the ulnocarpal impaction syndrome. Coming to the mid-carpal joint, their patient itself demonstrated the test. Patient will say, whenever I pick up the object, in me, I feel something, uh, click something abnormal happening at my wrist. Just have a look at this video. Now, can you see this abnormal clunk is happening at the mid-carpal level? And if you see from the top also, you can especially notice there is a abnormal moment happening at the intercarpal joint. So this was the uh, mid-carpal instability. Details, I'm not going. So another uh, first and fifth CMC joint. These are the mobile joint at the carpometacarpal joint. The first one is they have more mobile and it's more prone to uh, damages also, right? So see here, 
this patient is a hyperextension test. Moment I do an extension of the first CMC, the first metacarpal goes into extension, it grinds again the trapezium and patient complained that excruciating pain. You can see here this patient had the myelinated fracture that landed him to the post-traumatic arthritis of the first CMC joint, right? So another uh, degenerative uh, sign at the first CMC, you can see the counter of the base of the thumb is completely lost as compared to the opposite sign. So this is termed as a shoulder sign, right? You can see very clearly that counter is lost. And when you grind the first metacarpal against the trapezium, that crepitus, the pain is experienced by the patient. And this was the X-ray of the patient as uh, showing the degenerative uh, for CMC arthritis. So coming to the uh, radial side, now we are done with the ulnar side, coming to the radial side, most common, uh, the source of the pain is the scaphalunate ligament rupture. How do we do move the wrist from ulnar to radial deviation? Okay, so here I'm doing it. I'm keeping my thumb tip on the scaphoid tuberosity and from ulnar side, I'm moving it to the radial side moment it tried to flex the head uh, the, uh, the uh, distal pole of the scap scaphoid will hit against my uh, thumb and it will go pop dorsally out of the radiocarpal joint it will patient experience as a pain right and you can see this as a tetanus sign uh, widening of the scaphoid joint on the examination that is termed the tino sign uh, the uh, tetanus sign coming to the uh, tendon part the most common involved tenosynovitis, <clears throat> another the content tenomogenitis, tendinitis, and tendinosis, right? So we will see each one of them in detail now. The first dorsal compartment tenosynovitis, D. Carvans tenosynovitis, another very common thing which we see in day to day uh, OPD that patient complains the pain at the uh, anatomical snuff box. And the test is what we do is a Frankelson test. We ask the patient to do the uh, thumb uh, goes into the palm. The patient experiences the pain. And you can sometimes aggravate this pain by doing the uh, wrist flexion and thumb flexion in the palm, right? So that was about the first uh, uh, dorsal compartment. Coming to the other extensor uh, tendons, uh, do any test when you put uh, the tendons into the tension, doing the full extension. So if I ask this patient to do extend the finger, it will cause the pain and, and if you look at the patient's face that is saying that no it's uncomfortable it's paining and is pointing out where the pain is coming so registered extension to the long extensor will elicit the pain and then you can have the atinosinovitis of the long extensor so another test uh, specifically uh, for the uh, extensor carpal laris ECU that's a synergy test where the forearm is pronated and finger extension and we ask patient to do the resisted finger abduction. So you can see here, I'm a patient is in forearm pronated and I'm asking patient to abduct the finger and the patient is clearly pointing out the pain around the ECU. So that's the synergy test. Another, sometimes you see that, that extensor carpal nervous is moving out of its place, right? It's not in the, in its place. Or just this, just patient will demonstrate the test just look clearly at the ECU. It's subluxating and it's coming back. That's a snapping ECU subluxating from its bed that needs a, a repair of its uh, compartment, right? So another very, very, very common that we see in our day-to-day uh, -day is a uh, triggering of the finger. So because of the A1 pulley, which is blocking the excursion of the flexor tendon and getting click on the active extension. Coming to the uh, tenosynovitis of the flexor tendon, it's very commonly asked in the exam also, and we do see in the our, our patient department, Canavals uh, designed four uh, cardinal signs, the flex attitude of the finger, fusiform swelling, tenderness along the flexor shape. For this patient, even if you touch on the radial or ulnar side of the finger, patient will not have the pain. But if the moment you press on the flexor side, the patient will have the pain. And there is, of course, a painful passive extension of the affected digit. So the same patient drained a lot of um, 
uh, first from the operate uh, the surgical site and it was undergone the surgery. So again, the uh, this patient had the chronic infection landed into the tenosynovitis. So another uh, test uh, for FCU, the patient again will show that the patient has pain along the uh, FCU moment he grips, moment he to drive the bike, moment he lifts the any object, suppose the bag, he says that there is uh, the pain along the uh, flexor carpal laris. Now coming to the finger rotation, as as all the finger when we do the flexion, it all points towards the scaffold. This is my own hand. See the all the fingertips they are pointing towards the scaffold. But if you see out the other side. See at the top little finger, this is going away, deviating from the normal cascade. And if you see the bottom picture also, the middle finger is uh, overlapping the uh, ring finger. It's uh, causing the scissoring effect, right? So this the same patient, uh, we are asked to do deflection. So that is uh, having the scissoring effect. Now coming to the dorsal side of the hand, the extensor tendons, which we, we all know, that forms extensor food insertion of the lumbricals in tertiary, and it goes to the central sleep, and it uh, extends terminal as the uh, the terminal pharynx. This is the drawing which I'm sh showing. So this is the finger casket. This patient had undergone the uh, surgery at the wrist and post-operatively, if you can see, all the fingers are dropped except the little finger and the thumb. So that clearly indicates there is a extensor, long extensor tendon is ruptured. Now there is a sharp wound at the second picture, uh, which was uh, injured by the sharp object. And you can see that there is a middle finger drop. And there is, if you see this patient is doing deflection, but there is no active extension at PIP joint. So that's indicating the uh, central slip has been ruptured and that requires the surgical intervention. Another common, very common we see in the, uh, that is the dropped, the DIP, that is a mallet finger rupture of the extensor tendon, either bony or soft, depending on your X-ray findings. Now coming to the nerves, very commonly the patient comes and say that tingling in the median nerve. So how do we diagnose? Uh, we do either Phelan test or we do the Durkan's compression test. But I combine both the tests together. With the wrist flexion, the Phelan test and Durkan's, we, when we press the uh, median nerve at the car. Uh, at the carpal tunnel. Look at the test again. I am doing both the tests together. It increases the sensitivity and specificity of the test. Moment I keep, the patient is pointing finger towards the, uh, the tingling in the median nerve distribution. GANS can all compression of the ulnar nerve. You will have the loss of uh, intrinsic uh, function, lum ulnar two lumbricals. And this patient was having a uh, loss of 514R muscles, clawing, and wasting of the first dorsal introsiae, ulnar claw because the unopposed action of the finger extensor at the MCP joint and interphalangeal joint loss. So pointing in this again, uh, the anterior introsiae now, this patient had a elbow dislocation and this was the intraoperative uh, finding which we saw that nerve is entrapped at the fracture site, lateral it underwent recovery after the neurolysis and the surgical intervention. So radial nerve, wrist drop and the finger drop and the walking bug sign that you can see here, this patient actually has the posterior introsious nerve palsy, is not able to do active extension of the thumb. And he was he could do the extension of the wrist, which indicate the radial nerve is intact, but the entry and process nerve is down. So finally, the LNTS compression of the checking the patency of the ulnar and the radial artery. You see, uh, ask the patient to make a fist, and you compress both radial and the ulnar. Okay, and you can see at the color of the hand. It was pale, now it has, after releasing, it has turned the pink. 
right? You see test again. Ask the patient to make a fist. Compress radial and ulnar artery and release one by one. Now I'm releasing the uh, radial artery. You can see the pale. The hand still remains the pale. And moment I release the ulnar, it turns the pink. That indicates the radial artery is not patent. That's the Allen test for checking the patency of the ulnar and radial artery. So uh, finally, how do we measure the grip strength? Uh, many people don't know. Uh, for them, it's a pinch meter, which through it can uh, you can check the side pinch, the succession, and you compare that on the opposite side as well, right? So this is a pinch meter and compare uh, the opposite side as well. And this is a dynamometer, JMERS. Uh, you can measure the grip strength of the hand uh, on the affected and the non-affected side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Prashant. It was a very yes. nice presentation. And you made it very interesting with the uh, with the videos. And to I mean, <laughs> any 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 questions? Any comments? So it was a very short time for them to prepare this. <laughs> uh, I met him in the morning at US and uh, uh, Master Series. And thank you, thank you, Prashant, for for joining and presenting. Excellent. So we move further. Uh, I invite Dr. Karne, uh, Secretary Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, and he will be uh, talking on injection techniques in hand. Uh, so it is a combination of uh, office orthopedics with uh, uh, hand hand procedures in outpatients. Dr. Karne, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashok, for giving me the opportunity to have the. Uh, interaction with this august audience and uh, we are uh, looking going after a little bit different chapter you know it is out of the box chapter is the injection techniques in opd in upper it is the upper limb but then we will concentrate mainly on the hand well what is the indian scenario is the in opd you can get the non traumatic and the degenerative orthopedic conditions and these are increasing multifold the, in, in the past we were only orthopedic uh, trauma surgeons but now in the opd we are seeing most of these cold patients what common Indian patient wants, especially from the rural population or the middle or the lower socioeconomy status, he wants sustained and long-term pain relief. And he doesn't want surgery as far as possible. He's scared of surgery as well as he cannot afford it. So he considers surgery as a last resort. And if at all he's operated, as he spends a lot of money for surgery, expectations from the surgery are very high. And there is increasing number of the dissatisfied patient after surgery, especially in the degenerative conditions of the spine, shoulder and early arthritis in the knee joint. There is a dilemma for the doctors also. They have given all the treatment, the NSIDs, physiotherapy, all the different electrotherapy, different modalities, right from the ultrasound and everything. And still the patient doesn't get complete relief or a patient gets some relief, but it's just short term. Again, the patient's, everything gets by recurrence and, doc and patient doesn't want surgery also. Then there is a dilemma for the doctors in what to do. And he later on also, even if he gets relief, the patient doesn't want dependency on the NSIDs. So the local corticosteroid injections is one of the very important tool to treat such kind of patients, which can be in between the uh, NSID physiotherapy and the surgery. But it is not the only one. It is not can be, uh, should not be used as the only one mode of the treatment. It has to be followed by the maintenance therapy with the heating, proper exercises, and the care of that particular joint or the particular part of that uh, finger or the hand or the elbow. Now there are different uh, three different varieties. One is the intra-articular injections. Now, these are used mainly for the degenerative or the non effective and inflammatory arthritis or the synovitis. Inflammatory synovitis means it's not exactly rheumatoid one, but uh, patient's uh, reports may be negative, but he has got all those inflammatory uh, uh, non infective signs. Generally, they are the shoulder, elbow, wrist, first carpal, metacarpal, and even the MP joint as well as the IP joints. Then, if there is a chronic pain in the shoulder joint, you get the reports on the MRI, like some small tears are there, or the tendinosis is there, or some impingement signs are there. And uh, arthroscopy, uh, I feel it should be the last option. Rather, out of the 100 patients, only rarely one patient requires the arthroscopy. But 99% patient can get very good relief with the 
injections in the shoulder joint or in the subacromial space. Apart from intra-articular injections, there is a two types of the local injections. One is injections with the needling. Now, this is seen generally, we can use this generally in the uh, enthesopathies or where there is an insertional tendinopathies like tennis elbow or the golfer's elbow, or we can call it the medial or the lateral epicondylitis. There is another group where you uh, there is no need of needling or needle is not done. The one part is the tenosynovitis. Now, there are different areas in which it is seen. Generally, the dicker ones, or there is extensor tenosynovitis or the flexor tenosynovitis, which is the main cause of the actually carpal tunnel syndrome. And the trigger fingers in which they again the flexor tenosynovitis is at the level of the pulleys. And trigger finger, if the injection is given there, the pain goes off immediately, but the snap which they get during the movement that takes time to improve. And one care one has to take that when you're giving the injections around the tendon, one should never give in the tendon. And you can feel only because the dying procedure and you can get the feeling only while injecting that there has to be free flow or you should get that feel of give way when you are just keeping a sustained pressure just as we are doing the epidural. And uh, another part which is the local injection is in the ganglion, especially in the wrist ganglion. So what the corticosteroid injection they do, they reduce the inflammation which is there at that site, at that uh, level, but the inflammation can recur back again. So it has to be followed with the by the appropriate multimodal therapy, which I have just mentioned. What it can do, it can reduce the dose of systemic drugs, especially in the patient of the uh, rheumatoid arthritis, that the dose of the DMRD can be reduced and even the need for the NSAID also goes off once you give the, once the inflammation goes down. It improves the quality of the life with pain reduction and better function in a variety of the musculoskeletal conditions. And it avoids the need of surgery. And in some of the cases when the surgery is inevitable, it can postpone the surgery, especially in the case of the arthritis. And of course, there are no systemic effects of the local injections and there is never an addiction like the oral steroids. So precautions one should take before the injections. Most important is the counseling. Discuss with the patient that this injection is one, one step of your further treatment and you will require the treatment for the uh, in some of the conditions, in the degenerative conditions or in the rheumatoid one, you require the uh, further follow-up with other modalities of treatment uh, lifelong. And we have to tell in certain patients, especially degenerative arthritis, that this is just one which has a limitation that it postpone the surgery because the degeneration is one which is going on forever. And uh, after some certain limit, then the, when injections also don't work, then you have to go for that surgery. Then another part is the, in certain patients, after injection, there is exacerbation. The inflammation increases for one or two days and the patient should be made aware of all these things. Then because of all these things, the proper consent to avoid any medical legal issues is required. Uh, while giving injection at certain areas, uh, not in the hand, but especially in the area of the fibromyalgia or the plantar fasciitis, there is a severe pain during injection. So one can use the, which, have, which we have formed this Adi Mudra, a modified Adi Mudra. And if the patient takes, uh, does that, his fear goes down as well as the pain or so tolerance increases. And this can be used for giving any kind of injections anywhere. Of course, one has to say, check the blood sugar level before giving the injection and strict sepsis has to be followed because the chance of the infection uh, as compared to the other injections are very high because of the hydrocortisone or the uh, methylprednisolone. And of course, in the patient having an immun immunocompromised status, then one can give the preventive antibiotics or uh, if the injection is bilateral, one can give the preventive antibiotics. What are the joints which can use? I'm giving the injection right from the temporomandibular joint to the interphalangeal joint. Everywhere injection can be given. But the key is that injection should go in the cavity. It should not go in the capsule or the other interarticular structures or in the synovium or the ligaments intra-articular ligament, especially in the knee or the tendons in the shoulder, it should not go there. Then that causes a problem. While doing uh, giving injections in certain joints like the wrist or the ankle joint, one can use the emergent inspire or the small joints to uh, find whether your needle is exactly into the joint or not. For certain deeper joints like the shoulder or the hip joint, I use arthrography for that. And uh, again, one can use ultrasound guided uh, injections, but then Ultrasound is a little bit uh, prohibited, almost prohibited for orthopedic surgeon in India because of certain reasons like PCP and DT has to be followed. Now, this is a, a shoulder when one can, I, I go with the uh, posterior portal and I use, I first give the local anesthesia and then I use a dye there. Now you see the, here the two different dyes here, the inferior pouch, which is seen, which is generally there in the uh, normal uh, shoulder. And when the patient is having tendinosis or supraspinous tendinosis or other things are there, this key is seen, but here, if you see the inferior pouch is not seen. So this is sort of the adhesive capsulitis or we call it the frozen shoulder, but there also you can be injection. You can see certain, this type of things and you are sure 
that you are in the joint and then you can give the injection. But injection should not go in the capsule or the tendon. As I said, I give the arthroscopic portal in shoulder and elbow as well as the wrist. I spread the joint where as possible and there is a large effusion. Sometimes in any, you remove the maximum possible uh, effusion even it is in the shoulder also and give the injection to avoid the dilution. As I said, it's a blind procedure and you should get the feel of give way and that develops uh, gradually over a period of time when you uh, start using it. The methylprednisolone is more effective than the triumph syndrome because certain people, there is a canacord, certain people use canacord, but methylprednisolone has got a far better and longer effect than the uh, triumph syndrome. I use generally two cc of lignocaine with a one to two cc of the methylprednisolone and to make the volume issues in joints like shoulder joint, I use one to four cc of water for injection. When a smaller joints like the uh, uh, CMC joint or the MCP joint or the IP joints, the uh, you can have just half cc of the methylprednisolone is sufficient and the volume need not be more than one and a half to two centi two cc's. Then after the injection, you move the joint in cool range to have the better diffusion of the uh, drug all over the joint. And next interval can injection can be repeated after two to three weeks. Now this is a video of uh, intradural injection in the wrist. Are, are you getting the sound? Are you are you getting the sound? Hello? It's a little less. Yes, we are we are getting. We are getting okay. Now probably then here you will get maybe better sound. Yeah. We are going to give We are getting your sound, not the video sound. So not video sound. Oh. Okay. You can explain why the video No problem. A simple OPD preparation is also sufficient for that. Now here I'm going from the anterolateral portion here, the lateral to the uh, extensor tendons and the medial to the uh, scalar process. Suppose the pathology is on the radial side, I give, I give injections lateral to the tendon, uh, extensor tendon, but sometimes patient has got tenderness all around the uh, distal, uh, distal end of ulna, that is you can say TFCC or other uh, medial side pathology, then I enter on the medial side. This is a picture of the rheumatoid wrist. You can see the there is a reduction in the uh, joint space, severe reduction in the joint space. Now, generally, we give the traction. If you see the traction, you can see some increase in the joint space here. And you can have some joint space there because the joint space needs to be created there. So with the traction, on one side, on with one side, I'm giving the traction. The assistant give counter traction. And here we are post putting the needle. Now here the needle is in the intercarpal joint. So I go further and give the put the needle there between the radius and the uh, styloid. Here you can see the volume is hardly 4 cc. Total volume including. Now initially because of the joint expansion, the joint was uh, contracted. Patient gets a momentary pain. And here this giveaway is important. Now, once you start putting the uh, uh, this medicine in the contracted joint, later on you start getting the resistance, and that is another sign that you are exactly into the joint. If I remove the syringe only, you, are, you can get the backflow of the medicine. Now, here you can see after injection, the joint space has increased. It's after injection. So that is another sign that injection has got a right place. Now, after moving the uh, this joint in the full range of movement. At the right now uh, here, sometimes the patient has got limited extension and the flexion, but uh, sur uh, surprisingly after giving this injection because it contains anesthetic, we can here do the sort of manipulation and give the sustained uh, uh, palmar flexion as well as dorsiflexion and maintain it so that we can have a little bit more movement. Of course, if there is uh, added further allegiance in the extra articular area, they don't go down with it, but here you can find that in spite of such a contracted or rather reduced joint space, patient has almost got a full dorsiflexion. Now about the peritendinous injections. What I have shown you just now is used for the elbow, uh, elbow injections as well as shoulder injections. Now here generally the carpal tunnel syndrome, trigger finger and the extensor tenos are the one where we get generally give it. What is what I feel that in most of the such patients, the narrowing of the canal in the carpal tunnel or in the trigger finger is due to the inflammatory swelling of synovial sheets of the flexor tendons and rarely it, is, rarely it is due to the hypertrophy of the carpal ligaments. So local injections in the carpal tunnel can take care of this particular swelling and they decompress the tunnel from the within. 
Of course, the precaution that there is, has to be a need to have a free flow while giving the injection. An injection should not go into the joint or in the nerve. Any resistance indicates that the drug is going in the solid soft tissue and can cause problem either to the tendon to the nerve. Of course, once the patient gets relief, it should be followed by, as I told you, DMRD and the other precautions like the heating and the uh, um, exercises. Now here the extensor tenus analysis, of course I have ruled out that it's not a tuberculosis. We have taken the MRI scan also and we found it's only the inflammatory one. And here we are giving the injection. You are not getting sound now? I will just turn off my Bluetooth. Sound? Are you getting my sound now? Yes. Sir, when you click on share screen, there is an option for optimize for video streaming. You have to check that box. You have to stop your sharing and share again. Share screen at the bottom. You will find the video. Okay. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. This is extensor tenosynovitis dorsal. So now we are, we are giving This is extensor tenosynovitis dorsal. Extensor tendon. Take little up. Now, we have taken MRI scan that also has shown the dorsal extensor tenosynovitis, probably of the inflammatory origin. The swelling is distal to the dorsal carpal ligament. So here is the swelling. So just go transverse. We should not inject into the tendon. That's tangential to that. And now we have started injecting. I am feeling the resistance. But means I was in tendon. The moment the resistance has gone means I have come out of the tendon. And now I am injecting into the particular tumor. After the volume increased to certain level, the patient starts with pain of the expansion of that volume, but it goes down immediately because of the... Here you have to just inject into the tumor. Uh, anesthetic agent. And wait for some time. Okay. So similarly, I uh, go for the carpal tunnel also. Now here, the uh, injection is given again, as I said, it should be on the little bit on the medial side of the... Uh, tendons as well as the uh, nerve and there you can put into the carpal tunnel because I have never I have not operated the carpal tunnel for last 20 25 years I am treating all the patients with the uh, rather I have not given the plaster cast also when the patient fails to get relief of the medicines then we uh, give the local injections and this is as far as the ganglion this is the immobile ganglion but I show the one volar ganglion this is the volar ganglion bang near the radial artery this is about 15 millimeters in diameter. This is a bang over the radial artery, which is here. I can feel radial artery here. Now, that's why you have to go parallel to the tumor. And just go on injecting. You should feel the resistance. The resistance is the key that you are in the joint. Now you will find it is inflating, inflating, inflating. And go on pushing it. Now it has broken. So now it is broken. So it should break. That is a quantity one should put inside. And now go on pressing. She's a hysterical patient. Was not ready to take the injection. The wall has to be broken. Now just go on pressing so that the all the contents that ganglion they come out Generally, I tell the patient and that now this is the situation the you'll see it got completely flattened here this was the spot the same so the the uh, this was the spot so the the patient, you, want you should ensure that it goes completely some of the patients i have to give uh, say after few months for the reconnaissance i myself have got the dorsal ganglion three times and i i had myself injected uh, to me uh, of course one after another
the next is about the local injections in the local injection one has to have the needling has to be there i think that is the next idea no okay so here for tennis elbow as a golfer elbow one should use the additional needling one you have to find the maximum tender spot which is of course at the insertion not in the tendon in the insertion you can feel a definitely the grating sensation there sound there whenever you are injecting every time you, your needle feels that grating sensation then you can inject there at that spot so generally the one square centimeter area and after that needling then you can just uh, have a good massage and then Generally, pain comes on immediately. Yes, but the pain. Yes, we can do those movements of the uh, extension and the palmar flexion of the wrist as well as palmar flexion of the fingers, where the patient finds that the pain has gone. We can verify that uh, by the immediate clinical examination. So, the contraindications, of, of course, infection anywhere, especially in the body. If you want to give the intraarticular one, anywhere in the body, and the broken skin near the injection for the local one. then uncontrolled diabetes or bmo compromise but still i give the injection up to the 250 uh, mg percent of the bsl of course in the unstable circuit joint or the fracture one should not give or the allergy to the constant known allergy to constant of the drug in a gout sometimes in the feet there is a turbid effusion you can find there in turbid effusion one should not give it and unstable coagulopathy the relieved indication are again i say is a sterile or the scared patient and the prosthetic joints the theoretical complete rather this complication i have found that was the vaso vehicle but is not for the medicine it just a prick sometimes on a, uh, a hysterical patient or the psycho uh, psychological patient you can get vaso vehicle but i had found anaphylax in three of the patients then in early in the first one or two days you can get the post injection exacerbation because the rebound inflammation so that's why i put the bp vehicle for the prolonged action and the halocan is for the immediate action after that we start the nsd immediately because uh, till the action of the bp can goes the nsd takes over cold compresses are given in the first two days but afterward the cold itself can increase especially in the inflammatory uh, conditions it increases so there the heating is required for first two days one can go for cold compress and of course for the very bearing joints one should avoid excessive loading then hyperglycemia is some of the patients can be found but it is a transient one which lasts hardly for two or three days the delay complication is a theoretic one they have not come across any such complications for the hematomas and local immunosuppressions for subcutaneous injections like the golfer elbow or the tennis elbow or the dicker ones you can get white spots around that area but is the chance is much than less uh, than 1% and it is more of the triumphs in alone than the mitali prednis alone but we have to give the idea to the patient that this can last for 6 months even for the uh, uh, this ganglion also one can get the white spots and second thing if you use a more dilution then the chances of the white spots are much less or depigmentation are much less or hypopigmentation then tendon theoretical of the tendon attrition is less than 1% only if you inject into the joint and if the patient takes uh, does excess exertion after taking the injection then this can happen cartilage separation which is a theoretical one in the intraarticular injection but it is a transient one and reversible in 3 weeks and uh, generally the cartilage separation occurs in the very bearing joint because of the increased joint use due to pain relief but there are great advantages it is opd procedure it can avoid surgery in more than 90% patients of course in some patient it can postpone the surgery and we can buy the time till the patient is convinced of course it can be repeated many times it is highly cost effective and here you can gain the confidence of the patient and uh, you can improve the image of the patient that doctor has tried his best to avoid the surgery when i say even that when local medicine doesn't act how the uh, oral medicine is going to act and then patient can be ready for surgery in very exceptional conditions of course the limitation is accuracy during the injection is essential it should go into the joint or in the peritoneal sheath and not in the tendon the practice helps into that relief is of uh, limited duration and your further uh, maintenance of the relief it depends upon the multimodal therapy positive efforts are needed by the patient to prevent the recurrence and avoidance of the cold and especially in the rainy season and the cold season this increases in my 37 year of the practice i have treated more than 3 lakh patients of, out of that 2 lakhs are for degenerative and chronic uh, problems and 95% patient that is more than 100 and 1 lakh 80000 injections uh, i have given and uh, i give almost 15 injections per day and there are more than 95% satisfied patient so much so that i got undesired publicity i am injection doctor that if they want to avoid surgery they come to me but if they want surgery for egg joint replacement sometimes they go to the institutions uh, i am being the general orthopedic surgeon doing everything in the orthopedics 
Now, post injection, what is the maintenance therapy? One is effective counseling of the patient about regular follow up to prevent the further recurrence. Explain in detail about the consequences of a degenerative condition that is, it is going to last forever. Hitting is very much necessary for especially this Vat Prakruti. We, our allopathy doesn't recognize the individual uh, differentiation that there are uh, different constitutions. I am one of the Vat Prakruti patients. For such patients, in the cold season, rainy season, uh, you get more of the joint stiffness and the joint pain and the inflammation, especially you are find it after the age of 14 women and after the age of 55, 60 in the men. Then regular and proper relaxing exercises to avoid the recurrence. Of course, in the psychosomatic component, this is for the spine uh, patients, meditation is required and the stress important of the joint care as well as the back care. And if at all there is any uh, recurrence, you can see you can repeat injection, but not before three weeks. Uh, there is a There are different view of the papers. We won't go into details of those things. So we'll go to the take home message. The surgery is an option which can be used anytime, but it should be the last option. Patient should buy the surgery and we should not sell the surgery. Intractable injury or the local injection help a lot to avoid and postpone surgery. Of course, it should be combined followed, uh, followed by the adjuvant multimodal therapy. So we have to try to help the nature as much as possible. We should not try to go above or win over the nature. Be with the nature and help the natural processes. Be godly, but don't try to be God. Thank you very much. And or yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Karne. It was a nice, very nice presentation. So I, 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 I have a question. So you are on the medical legal cell. You are coming across many other uh, uh, medical legal allegations and this thing. So have you ever come across uh, uh, any any litigation post injection? Till today, I have not got any. Uh... Uh, even notice also or in the you can say the uh, a dissatisfied patient because I spend a lot of time in counseling the patient first. I tell no, them no, I am not a, asking your case in, in general. You, you, you also, outside. Yeah, no, yeah. Up till now nobody has uh, informed that there are certain cases where the patient got an infection after interacting knee injections and there there were the issues but then those were solved but uh, inject that was in main infection case but not because the dissatisfied patient uh, case that I have given taken sometimes in the uh, tend to achilles, the tear tear can occur if the injection goes in advently into the tendon because the chances of, uh, are very high in the tendon achilles. But they are also counseling of the patient because we tell them they, as, they, as your tendon has got attrition, attrition because of a Hagelin deformity there. And uh, as it is also without injection, their tendon achilles uh, tear can happen. So it is a counseling of the patient which is important. And of course, for medical legal, it is a consent. Especially for hypopigmentation in the women, around the wrist because that is seen at the ankle it doesn't not seen but at the wrist it is seen so you have to make them aware so, uh, another thing is uh, can you just clear about the preservative of the local anesthetic what we discussed last time for the benefit of uh, everyone i mean no, should actually, we use a new while every time no it is not so because i didn't say anything at that time when dr L. prakash said that he uses a separate while of the xylo card but uh, uh, my card once it is open, sometimes lasts for 7 to 10 days also. And I am not found the uh, fungus into that. You know, of course, I will say it is the environment. The fungus has to be introduced from somewhere somehow. But if the keep you keep the needle for longer time in the vial, then there is chance of the contamination. You should uh, 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 rather put a needle and uh, remove it immediately after use it. So as far as preservatives are concerned, the chance of the anaphylax, which I uh, just told you right now, that, that can be there. But on medical legal side, we generally ask the patient, have you taken any local anesthesia? Because the uh, anaphylaxis is not for the methyl prednisolone or a xylocaine sometimes, or it is because of preservative. And that preserve, if the patient has got any uh, uh, reaction in the past, we try to avoid analgesics as much as possible. But then uh, from theoretical point of view, from medical point of view, if the patient has not taken any local anesthetic before, it is better to do the testos of the xylocaine. Sir, I have a question. This is Abhijit here. <clears throat> is there any area or any condition where you would not consider giving steroid injection? As I told you, the contraindication or the infection around that particular part. Nothing else. Or uh, 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 when you aspirate, you, have, you, find you, don't, you don't find the clear fluid. In the rheumatoid, sometimes you find the turbid fluid in the rheumatoid one. But you can get the uh, turbid fluid like a gout. There I really don't use. But I almost use now in every patient's. And I have not repented. Well, what do you think in which condition there will be problem? Yeah, like plantar fasciitis, or oh, retrocalcaneal bursitis. 
Hitrocancallin is the one. See, there are two types of the uh, encephalopathies. One is because the traumatic. Our science is stressing mainly on the traumatic, the repeated trauma. There is a tennis elbow, golfer elbow. All these names have come from the repeated trauma. But if you find in our practice or uh, even the plantar fasciitis also, you people feel that there is a spurs which is the main cause of the all these things. But I, I generally explain all these things. My you know, other injection talk where I cover all the injections. We have found that this tennis elbow or the golfer elbow is there main, uh, sometimes in non-dominant hand also where they are not using uh, to that extent. Of course, one can get with a trauma. So if there is a traumatic tendons, okay, there I won't use this. Acute traumatic, especially tendon. Suppose you start playing the tennis and you start getting the tennis elbow or a badminton, uh, especially for backhand when you are using the backhand for the first time you can get it. There one should not use it because it's a trauma which has caused this. But mainly in a chronic inflammation, one has to use it. In the case of trauma, then I prefer PRP over the hydrocortisone because PRP has got a potential to heal the traumatic area. If it's the acute trauma or the chronic trauma at that local site is better to then PRP should go into the tendon because then it will act there. But here it reduces only the inflammation around the tendon. So in those conditions, in athletes especially around the tendons, I will try to avoid as much as possible. Right. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Karne. So we move on further from injections. We are going on. What wanted to ask something? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, sir. Yeah. Very nice talk, sir. Uh, what's your experience in terms of the recurrence in ganglions after your uh, aspiration and injection? No, I don't aspirate ganglion because it is quite a thick fluid which is there inside. I because I have found in my initial experimental days, I was a little bit uh, worried about the this uh, um, cystic. Uh, what you say, the um, uh, little thickened semi solid fluid going into the subcutaneous place. Uh, but then I realized that sometimes one or two days, patient can have some inflammation. But after two days, that is absorbed, being a biological fluid that gets absorbed. So I burst it open, and, uh, and the chance of recurrence are much less once you burst it open. Secondly, the recurrence are there, but at that same site, the recurrence was not there. Because when I have got a recurrence, so I, I had three different ganglion, different time, but they were at a different places. So here also ganglion, what I feel that it is one of the expression of the inflammatory uh, arthropathy or the, you can say, uh, soft tissues. Um, in a rheumatoid one, there are certain extra articular manifestations and it is one of that. So I treat the patient with the Mukherjee's regimen, which I have not mentioned here, there, along with the DMRD, it is better to give these patients because this is just one of the expression. Inflammation is just one of the expression of the whole disease. The disease goes on there. So one has this has to be followed by uh, drug treatment for ganglion also, but the chance of the recurrence are the same that of surgery. We can say I, I operated last ganglion thirty years ago. That also got recurrence after say six to eight months. Then I gave injection and then, then uh, that didn't come up. But then I have seen a one one of the lady who had thrice operated at the dorsal ganglion of the wrist and four times the ganglion had uh, came. So I gave injection there. But sometimes in such patient there are some adhesions there, but still. The patient accepts recurrence after injection rather than the recurrence after surgery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karne, sir. Uh, so we move on from injections to surgical part. So I invite Dr. Ajit Tiwari, hand surgeon from Kanpur. Uh, he will be delivering his talk on trigger finger. Dr. Ajit. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm our audible. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I must thanks to the officials of West Zone IO, especially the Karne sir and Godke sir and Abhijit Vai Gokha sir, for giving me this opportunity to talk on this topic of the trigger finger. So trigger finger is also, it's also known as stenosing tenosynovitis. And basically what happens that the patient has a painful catching and popping of the flexor tendon during flexion and extension of the fingers. Basically, what happens is that there's mechanical impingement of the distal flexure tendon as they pass through the narrowed retinocular pulley at the level of metacarpal head. So it's a, it's a, it, it has a bimodal distribution that you may encounter the patient in the younger age who has less than eight years, what that is called that the pediatric trigger fingers or pediatric trigger thumb. And another age group is that the fifth to six decades where the it's a more common the ladies, basically the females who has more it's a two to six times more prevalence in the females. The most commonly it's involved in the thumb followed by the ring finger, middle finger, little finger and index finger. And this something is called secondary trigger, which basically happens in the patients who has the systemic disorders or the systemic illness like diabetes, gout, renal, rheumatoid, 
and these kind of the patients they are uh, woes for the surge of woes for the conservative treatments they generally not respond well with the splints or the injections probably they are the ideal candidates for the surgery surgical treatments if i talk about the etiology how why and how this happens it's it's not very calm it's not very clear that how it happens but there are some risk factors like the genetic predispositions or the systemic metabolic conditions and the repetitive power gripping activities. So these activities, they, they causes the more, basically what happens, there's the swelling happens or the uh, thickness of the tendons is increased or there's a thickness of the pulley has increased. So thickening of the A1 pulley at the flexure tendon that disturbs the flexure tendon gliding at the tendon at the A1 pulley interface. Green has classified the trigger finger in the grade one, which is a pre-triggering. So these kind of the patients, they have basically the pain during the flexion and extension of the fingers, but there's no obvious triggering happens at the finger. Grade two, where the patient has active triggering is, active triggering is present, where you find that the, there's demonstrable catching, but the patient can actively extend the digit. Grade three was the passive, which is, which is further, uh, you know, that the uh, categorized as a grade 3A and 3B, whereas the patient has, you know, that the, requires the ca catching or the passive extension of the fingers in grade 3A and the passive flexion of the fingers in grade 3B and grade 4, which is basically the contractures, where the patient has a catching with the fixed flexion contracture of the PIP joint. So what is important? Clinical examination. I think the key thing is that the key most important thing is the clinical examination. When any patients of trigger finger coming in the OPD and the, you are saying that the, this is grade one patient is clearly able to flex the fingers, but he or she feel the pain during the flexion and extension, probably go and press at the uh, A1 pulley area and you'll find that some kind of tenderness will be there. Probably these, this, this is these finding which shows that this, this patient has a trigger finger, he is going to land up in the future in the active triggering or the passive triggering and the contractures. So clinical examination is the key most important thing. Differentiate between the decurvance and the trigger thumb, especially the trigger thumb where the patient has a, you know, the, the have a tenderness over the radial stellar area because of the decurvance and it may mimic like a trigger thumb. And other thing is that the rule out the PIP joint is stiffness because when many a time what happens that you have done the surgery to the patient is still patient has a pain reason behind there's a persistent flexion contractures and there's a stiffness happens at the PIP joint. So these kind of patients, there's only not have very happy patients. So before going through the surgeries, always rule out that the patient has PIP joint stiffness or not. So the treatment, we have the conservative treatment and surgical treatment. Let's talk about the splinting. So splinting is basically, it's a immobilization of the single joint. Either you immobilize the PIP joint or the MP joint by the joint blocking orthosis. And what our literature says that the immobilization of the single joint, preferably the PIP joint for the six weeks, these kind of patients, they, they resolve. The, I mean, the triggering is a uh, trigger finger is resolved with the splinting. And the nighttime splinting in acute cases for the six to eight weeks, around 55% of patients had complete resolution of the symptoms. Steroid injections, Karnesar has described very well about how to give the injections. Preferably is triamcelone uh, with one ml of, with the lignocans. Many people uh, prefer to give the depomedrol also, but uh, you can give the depomedrol or triamcelone, whatever. But literature says that the triamcelone has a better uh, result than the depomedrol and the response rate is around 45 to 80 percent of the patients they get better with the injections and there's no difference between the extra seat or the intra seat injections so literature says that if you put injection inside the sheath i means that uh, inside the tendon or just above the tendon inside the sheath or you just give injection under the skin above the seat it doesn't make much difference this uh, study which says that the multiple affected digits, the patient has 5.8 times more likely not to have response with the steroid compared to the, those with have single digit affected. So someone, if someone has a single finger trigger, you are giving the injections, they have the better, they will have better response rather than the someone who has multiple finger uh, trigger. So they have around less than, uh, it's a 5.8 times uh, less possibility up to getting betterment. So splinting versus the local steroid, uh, what the Patel and Bassani, they have follow-up for the one year, 
the splinting the patient uh, feel better around 66% of the patients and in injections around 84%. So this is multiple studies which shows that the <clears throat> single injection have a benefit of around 84% of the patients. Two injections is around 91% of the patients. So if, if we talk about the tramsulone and dexamethasone, in case of the tramsulone, it's uh, around at six weeks, around 63% of the patients feel better. And that, but long term, it doesn't make difference in the tramsulone and dexamethasone. So in early, in six weeks, obviously the tramsulone has a better outcome rather than compared to the dexamethasone. So uh, there's a percutaneous trigger finger release is there. So it's basically uh, recently in 2019, the Zai has published that he has studies on the 76 patient and 89 fingers in open and compared. It's randomized that the open and the percutaneous release. And what he found that there's no difference and so concluded the percutaneous method is as safe an effective alternative of the open methods. But you know that the percutaneous trigger release is, it, it requires a lot of uh, skill, it requires long learning curve because there's high possibility of injuring the digital nerves, injury of the tendons. So I'll, I'll advise that there's someone who has get the training in that in this procedure, probably Jai has a better result because he's more skilled and probably he has a good, uh, you know, the, the, he, he has a good experience in that. That's why he's getting good result. But it, it's not easy to get the, that kind of result in everyone's hand. So we have to be more careful before going for the this procedure. So surgery, it's, it's very important to know that the landmark of the different pulleys where they lie and, uh, because you need to put the incision at that place and you have to release the A1 pulley. So the open release, the important thing uh, in fingers, it's okay you, you, the, because the distal nurse goes on the both side of the tendons, but in case of the triggered thumb, you have to be very careful because the radial distal nerve, it crosses just over the A1 pulley. So when you are, uh, uh, when you are uh, doing the release of the trigger thumb, make sure that the radial distal nerve should be uh, properly pro uh, protected. So here's, a, he, here's the patient who has a bilateral trigger thumb. And uh, so when you are releasing the A1 pulley, always, uh, always careful about the not injuring the oblique pulley, which is just distal to the A1 pulley. Because if you release the oblique pulley, probably you may have the, uh, you know, the, the kind of bow stringing in case of the trigger thumb. Here's a Here's a key. Here's a. Uh, I, I just want to show a surgery. I mean that the uh, this patient has a trigger. So what happens that the pediatric trigger thumb you you find a kind of a nodule present over the base of the thumb over the A1 pulley that is called the notas nodule. So the incision should be it's a little bit more on the ulnar side rather than the radial side because the tendons are crossing from this side. So you put incision over the proximal flexor crease of the thumb. And, and uh, make sure that it, it should not be a very big incision. So, and then put incision, uh, uh, after putting the incision, always, always retract the soft tissue. And then you'll find that after the uh, dissection with the scissors, you'll, you'll, you'll find that the radial distal nerve is just lying above the uh, A1 pulley. So you can see that the, here is the radial distal nerve. So always, always protect because this this is very. If you're not careful about this, there's a high chance that you can injure because it's just crossing from the uh, medial to lateral side and crossing over the A1 pulley. So protect the uh, radial distal nerve. Put incision over A1 pulley, and you'll find that the glistening structure is will be popped up like that. The flexor tendon at the PL will be clearly seen on the after incising the A1 pulley. And make sure that it should be completely released both proximally and distally. And you should be very gentle because if you'll be very, uh, I mean that if you'll not be careful, you can injure the tendon also. And once you have released the pulley completely, try to take out the, or uh, try to just pull out the tendon and see that is the tendon is com coming out or not. And if once you see that the tendon is easily gliding and there's no kind of constriction over the tendon probably you have your release is complete so uh after the 
have, once you have released the A1 pulley completely and check that the, your tendon is, I mean that the radial distal nerve is protected properly and then you can close the wound. And it's a prefer, it, it preferably put the absorbable sutures in case of the kits because it's very difficult to remove the stitches. So these are the absorbable rapid vacuole sutures. They, they, they take care of the things and won't heal properly. So here's, here's a patient who has a triggering as uh, previously the doctor has shown that, uh, that how the trigger finger looks like. So you, you find that the patient has triggering. This is the another side of the patient. Uh, so this, this, what is the treatment algorithm based on the current, uh, current uh, concepts? So if someone has a trigger, less than three months means that the acute trigger is there. Give the splint to the patient for the six weeks. If the patient is fine, it's okay. If patient is, if there's no improvement, probably it's a good choice to give the corticosteroid injection to the patients. And if there's no improvement, probably the surgery is the better option. So I want to summarize that, identify the trigger finger early, because once you identify the early, probably you can give better treatment to the patients. By the, I mean that the patient can be uh, better with the splint only or the injections only, patient may not need the surgical treatments. So uh, early identification is important. Splinting and rest is helpful in acute trigger finger. Steroid injection is potential option and should be considered even in diabetic patients also. Open release remains the benchmark operations for the trigger finger and careful about the radial distal nerve, especially in the release of the trigger thumb. Thank you so much for your patience hearing. I'd be happy to uh, answer the questions if anyone has. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Um, Ajit, uh, this is Abhijit here. Uh, yes, sir. Very quick uh, comment rather than a question. Uh, very interestingly, I'm sorry, my uh, webcam is not working. There is something wrong with that. So uh, there is a very interesting procedure that has been described by uh, one French surgeon called Dominic Leviat. And the procedure has a very fancy name. It's called as USSR. And the acronym stands for ulnar superficialis slip resection. So when you have these long standing triggers with a slight flexion contracture of the finger, uh, he recommends resecting the uh, ulnar slip of the FDS uh, at the campus chiasma. And that kind of uh, helps in uh, minimizing the flexure con flexion contracture. So it's just kind of something that I wanted to share. And I have done it in a few cases uh, earlier on in my experience. And I found it to be a quite uh, uh, useful technique and uh, something that can combat flexion contractures in long-standing triggers. Thank you. Yes, sir. thank you. So actually, uh, there's, there's, uh, 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 I, I was uh, studying, so I, I found that the, when the patient has a recurrence, of the, even after the surgery, the, someone has a recurrence of the trigger finger. So many people uh, prefer to do the release of the, even the A2 pulley also, A2 release of the A2 pulley or taking out the one slip of the FDS so that the recurrence may, should not happen. So, it, but this should be considered only in case of recurrence rather than the primary uh, release of the trigger finger. Right, right, thank you. Dr. Ajit, uh, yes, how sir. long do you immobilize the patient after surgery? Uh, so I, I basically start the patient uh, mobilization from the same day onwards. I generally don't immobilize the patients, but there's a bulky dressings over the surgery site to just prevent the hematoma formation and uh, a kind of uh, a kind of uh, you know the, the bulky dressing so that the patient will have a little bit of support and that prevents the hematoma formation. But mobilization should be from the same day. I, I don't immobilize the patient. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ajit. <coughs> thank you, sir. We, thank we you so much. Thank you. So we move on further. Uh, I invite Dr. Abhijit Vahe doctor. He will be speaking on uh, decurvance disease. Yeah. Ghorke, sir, before we move on, there are a couple of questions on the okay. YouTube channel. First question is, uh, in ganglia, how, uh, how, after how many days can we repeat the injection? 
And there is another question. Do you prefer steroid injection for plantar fasciitis? This is, uh, these are two questions on the chat box of the YouTube channel. So if uh, very quickly, Karane sir can answer those questions, please. So the ganglion, say the injection is to be repaired only if there is a recurrence. There is no recurrence. There is no need to repeat the injection because the tumor is not there at all. The tumor immediately uh, bursts at the time of the injection. So second injection is not required unless there is a recurrence, which is not at least uh, less than six months. Second is plantar fasciitis. Rather, the plantar fasciitis, there is a separate talk on plantar fasciitis. But what I can say that plantar fasciitis is one of the most painful injections. That is one thing. So I do it under the block. Block is given only on the bedial side. No, no need to give the lateral side block. The injection is like a multiple uh, needling. First, I give the block. I wait for 10 to 15 minutes for the block to take action. Then we put the needle mainly on the medial side, not from the plantar side. Because the point of the entry should be from the medial side. And there, uh, one can go and at the junction of the, you can see the base of the sp uh, spine when you can see. Sometimes you don't see the spur at all. Okay, those patients are symptomatic, but that that that, that junction of the plantar surface of the calcaneum as well as the uh, uh, that that area, you can put the needle there and you can feel a distinct grating sensation because what I feel that there is a fibrocartilage metaplasia at the insertion of the periosteum into the bone. At that site, you first inject and then you do the needling there. The chance of the recurrence of the plantar fasciitis is less if the patient follows further management as I, as I told that following of this uh, prevention of the uh, what manifestations by doing the local injections and uh, using the uh, sleepers and the um, especially in the night time because this patient gets more pain when they come out of the bed or sit at one place for a long time there are two different types of plantar fasciitis one is a which is actually mechanical one where the pain is not there in the beginning but the pain starts uh, once you start up walking few distance and pain is there and the pain increases more once you start more, walking more and more this is described very well in our books but the most of the time in our practice, what we find is an inflammatory kind of thing where the pain is more when you get up. When you, once you start walking, sometimes the patient has to limp or walk on the toes. And then gradually over a period of time, say 15 or 20 minutes later, the patient's pain goes down, especially when the patient takes hot bath. So for that, the injection is highly, extremely helpful. The only thing is the inflammation should not come back again. And these, uh, as I told you, these are the further medications which are required for prevention of injection. I am also I'm suffering from plantar fasciitis for almost last 25 to 30 years. But then you will not find me any time without uh, socks or the either footwear, chapel or even at the home also. Because if I stand on the these tiles, cold tiles, within 15 minutes I start getting the pain. But I have not taken any medication or the uh, injection. Of course, there was nobody to give me the injection. But then uh, that is a condition. Means the condition is there. Only you can control the condition. So even after surgery, rather the last surgery which I did for plantar fasciitis around 35 years ago, and patient got recurrence after six months. So uh, that particular patient, then we gave the gave him the injection. So injection is the one which takes out the inflammation. Surgery is the one which takes out local structures. But the body's tendency is there to get the inflammation again because of all these reasons. So we have to avoid the re recurrence of inflammation. So plantar for plantar fasciitis, the injection is really rewarding. I hope I have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Karne. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Ajit. So, I invite uh, Dr. Abhijit Vahegaukar. Thank you. Um, so, I want to uh, acknowledge the West Zone and the IOA uh, leadership for the opportunity to contribute to this uh, webinar. <clears throat> And especially to Dr. Gorke for uh, putting this together at a very short notice. And of course, all the speakers who were given only perhaps a day intimation, intimation for joining the webinar. I'm very grateful for that. And uh, it's a very interesting kind of a topic that we uh, thought about having um, a webinar on, on outpatient or ambulatory surgery for hand surgery. Excuse me. And then decurvens tenosynovitis, obviously many of you will uh, concede, is a very common problem that we'll encounter in clinical practice and is one of the most frequently performed daycare procedures, whether it is an injection or whether it is a surgery. So let us begin with understanding what is decurvens tenosynovitis. So it was Fritz de Carvin, that's the French pronunciation who in 1895 was credited for the recognition of this disease. 
Um, and then uh, this is a, something that usually affects individuals in the fourth and the fifth decade of life and is somehow uh, slightly more common in females than in males. It usually result, results from an in, inadequacy um, in the first dorsal compartment. Um, and this uh, uh, in turn re uh, results in tenosynovitis. And then more often than not, uh, repetitive movement has been um, blamed as the culprit or the causative reason why people develop this uh, particular condition. The etiology kind of uh, ranges from trauma to increase frictional forces or anatomical abnormalities along with biomechanical compression, uh, repetitive microtrauma, inflammatory changes, um, or an increased uh, volume state such as that occurs in pregnancy. And more often than not, people who have operated on decurvins tenosynovitis will encounter some kind of an anatomic variation in the form of either septation for the first dorsal compartment, that's to say there is a compartment within the compartment, or the presence of multiple slips of the um, abductor pollicis longus and occasionally of the extensor pollicis brevis. So what are the clinical signs and symptoms that a, present, that a patient will present with? More often than not, they will complain of pain on the radial aspect of the wrist joint and any patient complaining of pain on the radial aspect of the wrist joint, this is one of the most important differential diagnoses. There may be some swelling that uh, the patient would also point to or would have noticed on the dorsoradial aspect, um, especially of the radial styloid region. Uh, there may be a thickening of the tendon sheath and the pulley uh, on palpation, and there sometimes may be uh, a crepitus uh, with thumb movement. And we find that this uh, pain increases upon ulnar deviation of the hand, uh, which forms the basis of the so-called Eichhoff or the Finkelstein's test. And the pinch and the grip strength uh, would be affected because of this pain and the debilitating nature of this particular condition. The pathophysiology of this condition has been studied, and uh, there are several reports uh, which state that this is caused by attritional forces secondary to friction, and the functional impairment is secondary to resisted gliding within the first dorsal compartment, which is narrowed, uh, resulting in pain and reduced movement. The histopathological studies um, have been reported by an author by the name of Clark. And he said that uh, more often than not, um, this is a degenerative process rather than an inflammatory process. So we don't find inflammatory cells in the histopathological examination of the tissue of the tendon sheath, as well as the wall of the extensor compartment that is excised and sent for histopathology. So with that backdrop of understanding how it presents, what it is, and the pathology, uh, let's try and understand how is it diagnosed. And more often than not, the diagnosis is clinical. And we rely on uh, the history and then certain tests. One of these tests is the Eichhoff test, uh, which is shown in this uh, illustrative figure here where the patient holds his thumb in full flexion and adduction, and the wrist is deviated in an under direction by the examining clinician. And in this maneuver, if the patient complains of pain around the radial standard process, it suggests the diagnosis of, um, of decurvin's tenosynovitis. The other test, which may be very familiar to most of you, is the Finkelstein's test. Here, the examiner holds the forearm of the patient with his hand, and uh, which is the opposite uh, to that of the patient's hand, and then pulls the thumb uh, in a deviation, and then there is pain uh, over the radial cell process. And then the third test is something called as a WHAT test, W-H-A-T, being the acronym for wrist hyperflexion and abduction of the thumb. So it's a palmar abduction. This test was described by Jean Goubeau, from Belgium. And uh, this test is a very um, 
interesting test because it is 100% sensitive and specific for decavis tenosynovitis. And interestingly, it is a patient controlled test. So it's not as painful as the Finkelstein's or the Eichhoff test. And in fact, if you were to perform the Finkelstein's test, I think most of you will experience pain yourselves, even if you do not suffer from decavis tenosynovitis. Now the what test, when you hyperflex the wrist joint, you are causing a tenodesis of all the extensor compartment tendons, except for the abductor policy, the first dorsal compartment. And then the patient can abduct in the palmar direction and you can give the resistance and the patient can determine how much resistance or how much stress he, should, he or she should apply. And if they have pain, again, on the lateral aspect of the radius, then it is 100% sensitive and specific for decavis tenosynovitis. Now, besides clinical examination, which has already clinched the diagnosis of decavis tenosynovitis, you may want to advise uh, certain uh, investigations such as an ultrasound examination, uh, wherein uh, you are interested in looking at any intratendinous septum uh, between the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis, which is usually present in about 10% of the cases. And a presence of this septum reduces the likelihood of response to a non-operative kind of line of treatment. Sometimes an MRI also may be advised or the patient might come with the MRI and on actual sections, you might see this. <laughs> Excuse me. You might see this uh, tendonitis or this fluid around the first dorsal compartment or the lateral aspect of the wrist joint. The management of this condition usually begins with a trial of, uh, of non-operative treatment for a reasonable period of time, which includes uh, splints and uh, some manual therapy, ultrasound therapy, uh, hot fermentation and ice therapy with, uh, along with some analgesics. Sometimes even a local corticosteroid injection may be given. And if uh, you have um, failure to respond to this line of treatment after a sufficient or a reasonable period of time, surgery can be offered to these uh, group of patients. Uh, the incisions that have been described for decurvinced tenosynovitis are usually, the recommended incisions are a lazy S incision or a transverse incision, which are more cosmetic. In this video, you're going to see a longitudinal incision because this patient was also suffering from uh, CMC arthritis, and we wanted to uh, deal with that as well. So this is the initial part of the surgery, wherein uh, we have done a decur veins uh, tenosynovite uh, uh, release, the first dorsal compartment release. The first order of business when you do the surgery is to identify the superficial branches or the sensory branches of the superficial radial nerve, and then put them out of harm's view uh, so that uh, you prevent any painful neuroma that may form. The dissection continues with uh, sharp and blunt dissection, and uh, you identify the uh, first dorsal compartment roof, and you de-roof the compartment. We try to stay as dorsal as possible uh, and try and avoid any volar release of the compartment because one of the complications of decurvins tenosynovitis surgery is volar subluxation of the tendons, and you don't want that to happen. Here, the tendons are coming into view, and you can find that besides multiple slips of the tendon, there is a intracompartmental septum with a small slip of the abductor pollicis longus uh, going into a very tight compartment, and missing this uh, entity or miss, missing this septum is one of the commonest reasons of relapse or recurrence of pain in patients with decurvin stenosynovitis. So here we um, go about releasing that septum, um, which contains a separate uh, compartment, and you release the tendon so that you, uh, your release is now complete. So with sharp, you can see how tight that compartment is and how rigid the fibrosis tunnel roof is. And then once you have released the entire uh, septum, you have the tendon inside and complete 
release is done. At this moment in time, we put into evidence uh, all the tendons together. We release, we excise a small bit of the wall of the septum on the dorsal side. And then you will see the multiple sept uh, tendons that are present in this particular case, along with a intracompartmental septum that we just saw a little while ago. And then closure is usually with, no, with absorbable sutures and a bulky dressing that uh, helps with post-operative uh, comfort. The complications of um, this particular problem can be classified as those associated with corticosteroid injections and those associated with surgery. And those uh, complications that we see with an injection are usually of either fat necrosis or subcutaneous atrophy and skin depigmentation. And this occurs in about five to 10% of patients and the patients have to be counseled about this, especially the skin depigmentation. And then complications of surgery usually include uh, an injury to the radial sensory nerve, uh, an incomplete decompression that is one of the reasons why there is a relapse or recurrence of the pain. And uh, I just mentioned about the volar subluxation of the tendons. Besides these minor complications uh, that we may encounter are those of scar hypertrophy and tenderness, a reflex sympathetic dystrophy, or continued pain as a result of incorrect diagnosis or because of associated conditions, the commonest being arthritis of the CNC or the STT, the scaphotrapezio trapezoid joint, or the intersection syndrome or the Wartenberg syndrome. And all of these need to be kept in mind or to be born in mind before we set about treating the patient and the patient has to be counseled about the possibility of these diagnosis. So with that, again, I thank you for your attention and the opportunity to present here. Any questions that you may have, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, very nice presentation. So uh, I have a question. Uh, we come across this decurrence disease very commonly in female patients during pregnancy. Uh, in those cases, would you recommend to just wait and watch uh, or should we be very aggressive on the treatment? A uh, very good question, Dr. Ghorke. In fact, uh, and this is a recognized uh, um, reason why uh, decurvins uh, tenosynovitis may occur. And in fact, uh, when we have a relatively young lady walk-in or an elderly lady walk-in who is of a granny's age, we always ask them if you have a little child at home. And they're surprised, you know, as to why, how did we know? And uh, that's just because um, this is a very common condition associated with new mothers or with grannies who are assisting with uh, the child care. Uh, whether it is in pregnancy or post-pregnancy because of nurse nursing the child or otherwise, about 80 to 90% of decurvin stenosynovitis patients will respond to a non-operative line of treatment. And um, we just have to counsel the patients at length about the necessity of rest, using splints and modification of activities of daily living along with some therapy. And they usually respond to non-operative line of treatment. It is only when you have multiple tendons, uh, which is um, a... Uh, anatomical variation or a, a intra um, kind of compartmental septum in about 10% of patients, these are the patients who will not respond or will have um, recurrence of pain or are not satisfied with the non-operative treatment. And of course, their um, demands of day-to-day -day life or their profession also dictate whether surgery should be considered. But in our practice, we are very patient with, uh, and we are not trigger happy with recommending surgery and more often than not, they will resolve with non-operative treatment. Thank you so much, Dr. Vijay. Thank you. Uh, so we are already running out of time. Uh, there is a slight change in the, in the program. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Anil Bhatt. He is uh, HOD hand unit at KMC Manipal. Uh, he has two two talks. One is on uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and one is on CRPS. And in between, 
I had a talk, but uh, because of time constraint, I will take this talk in the next uh, uh, coming uh, Sunday. So uh, I request Dr. Anil sir to take uh, the uh, both the topics consecutively. Recently, uh, they have also started MCH hand at KMC Manipal under Dr. Anil Bhatsar. Thank, Thank you, Ashok, Ashok uh, for this opportunity. Is my screen visible? visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. I thank the West Zone Orthopedic Association for this uh, opportunity, uh, Amjit Ashok and Dr. Anil Bhatsar. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, again, uh, most of the cases who walk in, basically our diagnosis is always clinically. And uh, of course, investigations do help to confirm the diagnosis sometimes, but most of the time to rule out other kind of situations. But at the end of the day, the diagnosis... Me, uh, Anil, sir, uh, yeah. your, your, your voice is echoing a bit. Yeah, there is uh, an echo in, in, the, in the voice, Anil. Okay. okay. Is, is this better, better now? I switch, switch off, off the video. video. Sure. No, no, no. Still, still, we still have an echo. No. So are you using earphone kind of thing, something? Absolutely nothing. nothing. Oh, okay. Would, would you like to try an earphone and uh, if you have one? Or, or have you opened the two mobile as well as laptop simultaneously? No, sir. <laughs> uh, I just... Stop sharing and they can try to. Yeah, yeah. Let's try. No, no, I think the echo was there even in the beginning, Anil, when we started off. Yes. Yeah. From, from my laptop? Yeah, yeah. Even now the echo is there? Yeah, yeah, still there. Still there. Okay. Should I come back? No, uh, no, sure, uh, my, um, my volume. Sometimes my volume is to be reduced. Okay. You can go in the settings. And reduce the mic only. Or, so, or if you have earphones, you can try that perhaps. In audio settings, you have got that uh, opportunity. Is it better, better now, now or? No, no, the question present. I just. Have you uh, reduced the settings? I'll show you how to reduce the setting. I'll just share the screen. Never happened before. So. Oh God! Okay. It is going to take time for that question. Great. Right. I can show you my screen. For the mute, this upper arrow that in the audio setting, and so you can reduce it. Um, I'm actually not able to hear. I mean, there's a lot of disturbance in your voice. Is that totally for me? Yeah, there is, there is disturbance in Dr. Karan's voice. My microphone. Yeah, now, now, now it's fine. I'll just log out and come back again. One yeah, please. Sorry for this. Now, is my microphone okay now? Yes, sir. No, because I have reduced my microphone volume now. Uh, a question to Dr. Abhijit. Uh, how do you differentiate between an intersection syndrome and a D curve and clinical? Uh, so the what test is very important and the location of the pain is very different. The intersection syndrome is more proximal and more dorsal, whereas the, um, the D curve and stenosynovitis pain is more dorsoradial. And besides that, the what test is very specific and sensitive for decub and stenosynovitis. Abhijit, what is the difference between the ICOP test and the Tinkelstein test? Basic difference. 
So the ICOF test is uh, where the uh, the examiner will perform the ulnar deviation. Uh, it's a passive test, whereas in the Finkelstein's test, the patient will bring the thumbs and uh, in the palm, and then it's a, it's a it's a um, active or a dynamic test. It's active and versus passive one. Yes, sir. I think Anil is back and. Um, am, I, am I audible? Is it better? Yeah, yeah, much, yeah. Better, much better. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so as I was telling that uh, the carpal tunnel uh, diagnosis is basically clinical and at decision making also a lot of times uh, becomes clinical for us to go between operative and non-operative managements and investigations a lot of times, most of the times for documentation purpose. So in that sense, when a patient walks into the OPD, we need to stress on thorough case history as to start off with uh, the type of pain, which fingers, and uh, you know, rule out other things like uh, neck pain, uh, diabetes, thyroid, hypothyroidism, and all these should be asked in the beginning itself. Otherwise, we'll always miss these things. And anything which is not matching the classical history of you know night pain, paresthesia, uh, radial three and a half fingers, and you know, all these things, then you start thinking whether there's something more. So. Uh, try to get the classical history most of the times. <clears throat> Nocturnal paresthesia early on is, is one of the classical uh, kind of uh, presentation. And except very few times when it's occupation related, most of the idiopathic carpal tunnel syndromes have this particular symptom. Hand position and movements is, is again asked for specifically. As I said, very rarely patients do come with, you know, instrument use, vibrating tools, you know, come these uh, uh, people using computers and laptops. So those are very minor, actually. But most of the idiopathic carpal tunnels uh, coming, the ladies coming in have the classical history. Where they get the numbness, paresthesia, pain, and radiation is very, very important. And the moment they deviate from the classical kind of presentation, start thinking other differential diagnosis. If there are predisposing factors, as I said, diabetes or hypothyroidism or rheumatoid, any of these, please ask at the time in the first uh, presentation itself. And any alleviating factors should be asked for. If you look at this American Hand Society uh, recommendations of the tests itself, the Durkins is one of the most specific one. And, uh, uh, and the hand diagram is also quite sensitive if we ask them to write where the problems are. And this is one of the ways which we can ask them where exactly the problems are. And uh, the NCV is, is, is basically as an additional kind of a, the electrodiagnostic studies are basically more of supportive in nature. And it could be a probable CTS. That's what they define this. And uh, EMG, again, is only an advanced motor uh, uh, neuropathy. So when the wasting starts and when the muscle starts uh, developing weakness, the EMG comes into picture. So as I said, it's more of the documentation purpose, but we always do this, both the nerve conduction and EMGs. Ultrasound has been a very uh, useful investigation, especially in our unit and department. We've been doing it for a long time now for looking at anatomical aberrations, any ganglions, bifid median nerve, anomalous structures, synovitis, because we are, I also do a, a endoscopic carpal tunnel release. So ultrasound helps me a lot. Uh, and also they give measurement of the cross-sectional area. That's one way of doing it. And very, very rarely MRI if you have any kind of suspicion. So, that, But the NCV, when they, when they come to you with the report, they always come with the grading. Uh, the, the, the report always says mild, moderate, or severe kind of grading. It just helps you to convince the patient in terms of whether surgery is required or not. And grade four and five and six, which are extremely severe with sometimes uh, absolute, uh, you know, a complete wasting of the thinar muscles. And these are the patients who might not really recover with their symptoms for a long time, and you need to tell the prognosis for these patients. Treatment options, two things, obviously conservative and surgical. The first line of management is always conservative when we have a mild to moderate kind of a disease. And most classically, we use a splint, a night splint especially, Make sure the splint is worn properly, the extent is proper like this. Not sometimes I see the patients having the splint covering up to their MCP joints and finger joints and actually not causing much uh, relief. And so if a splint is wrongly worn in an a, in a incorrect manner, it actually aggravates the symptoms. So what we need is basically some amount of a minimal amount of dorsiflexion or neutral position so that the wrist is kept in that position, especially in the night so that the nerve doesn't go for any uh, you know, further compression. 
and uh, it decreases the it's been shown that in neutral position it decreases the pressure in the carpal tunnel the studies have shown that so that is what it is medications uh, generally we rely on vitamin b12 if there is a component of inflammatory component we add in nsaids along with the vitamin b12 and pregabalin more for most of these patients very very rarely steroid injections there are some nerve gliding exercises we can start them so that you know there is some amount of mobility of the nerve itself uh, against these are there no long term studies on this age older than 50 years duration is very very important patient always comes to you telling you no know, it's it's been there since two months three months but if you really dig deep they always tell it's been there since two years you know on and off and not only now it has been you know aggravated so always make sure you document that very importantly that, uh, that this uh, particular condition has been there from long that's very very important for us otherwise they always hide that fact that it's been there for many years and you always think it's just there there for a good couple of months and uh, duration more the duration the, the worse the prognosis always tell the patient that constant paresthesia present there could be associated flexitino synovitis any phalanx coming less than 30 seconds so always when we do the phalanx test or the things or any of these things uh, which was shown earlier always uh, write the time how soon the, the paresthesia starts so lesser the time means more the severe the disease so phalanx test less than 30 seconds so when you have all these tell the patient that your conservative management might not really work well and you might have to require surgery but of course put them on conservative management and let them always come back and ask for surgery steroid injection has been extensively talked about you can either use landmark in injection as uh, kanesh has been doing or also do an ultrasound guided kind of injection if you have facilities for that quite effective for symptom relief and it also predicts a success for surgery if the patient is responding well probably the surgery is is also going to be good but uh, there is no neurophysiological improvement just because you give an injection it's basically more of uh, anti inflammatory kind of an action which comes in there surgical management at least 3 weeks 3 to 6 weeks is a conservative treatment uh, period and if it fails after that uh, you can suggest patient either an open or a mini open or endoscopic kind of release based on your uh, expertise and facilities the classic uh, gold standard of course is open carpal tunnel release you can do it in a local brachial plexus block or general anesthesia and you open up everything see directly under direct vision and so the complications are quite less with an open release but of course uh, there is a scar especially in the palm so that is what will cause uh, a lot of problems especially in the initial period most studies if you look at any of these studies they tell beyond 6 months everything is same all procedures are same so it's in the initial period which is very important the patient wants to go back to work early probably you need to think of less invasive procedures a mini open release uh, i rarely do this because uh, uh, it, it's it's a very small area 1 cm incision less post op pain equal efficacy they say of open release definitely we need the expertise we need the experience and you need to know when to open up completely right so the more i think we see more of uh, uh, the more experience we get we always feel that always what is there to put another centimeter more of an incision absolutely doesn't matter so just for the fancy of doing any open release don't get into complications that's the only thing i can tell an open carpal tunnel release is a classic uh, uh, kind of a procedure and uh, the basically the incision i'm just showing the landmarks but we don't really put all these lines the thena crease is your uh, first landmark and always be alert to the thena site uh, in these carpal tunnel uh, releases so about 6 mm or about 8 mm alert to this is your point where your incision has to come in uh, keep towards the ring finger here that's your always your landmark and that is the extent of incision you can reduce it increase it based on your expertise okay and uh, you always as i said just just at the cradle border the ring finger is your line that's where the capillary lines actually intersect okay so that is the basic landmark of uh, how you go about it and uh, generally if you flex the ring finger and you know put it there it usually shows the distal extent of the uh, that is where the the finger comes and joins and that is the distal extent of the tunnel itself this crease is your proximal extent if at all you want to go back 
approximately in case you want extend insertion for any reason again always go towards the ulna side this is basically to protect the uh, the branch of the median now coming in here which can be uh, you know caught uh, during the insertion here so the recurrent branch is one which is in danger there so if at all you want to go always go towards the ulna side it is cross fraction if you want to cross the risk please otherwise this is the extent of the insertion you would like to put So basically, as I said, the problem is that the scar is in the palm, and so that delays the healing to a certain extent. So patient uh, obviously can't go back to work early. So this is all criticism of a local carpet tunnel release. There are the concepts of the you know, pillar pain and all these things, but generally it's more of scar tenderness. So once the subcutaneous tissue is uh, retracted, the dissected out, you see the palmar polyurosis coming in, and uh, basically you need to uh, start from proximal to distal and what we need to see is a nerve somewhere along the line which means that we need to make a small incision here uh, where the nerve can be seen and once the nerve is seen you protect the nerve throughout and then start uh, doing your dissection so generally at the proximal end here you will start putting your incision through the palmar abscess and through the carpal the transcapital ligament here and once you see the nerve uh it the rest of the procedure becomes easy where you can just protect the nerve what you see now is basically the palmar spruce <coughs> just on the uh palmar palmar polyurus is here you have the palmar spruce muscle some patients do have a very kind of thick palmar brevis or palmar spruce and uh you just have to dissect that through through and through and some might have very flimsy kind of muscle tissue there and once that's done you you make a nick through the transcapital ligament there and you will see the nerve a uh, slightly yellowish slightly dull uh, uh, structure there that's all you need to see what now what you what you are visualizing there and once you do that you have to protect the nerve so don't put your incision through and through to the entire transcapital ligament you may cut the nerve at any point of time so just expose the nerve to a certain extent here Put your retractor, a McDonald's kind of an elevator here would be good uh, uh, for you to protect the nerve. So the nerve is completely now under this elevator here, and through then you can be very bold in cutting your transcapital ligament. Uh, so this is how the incision is made uh, through the transcapital ligament, and as and when you do this really here, you replace this uh, um, uh, elevator, you know, over the nerve like this. And as you come towards the distal aspect, you know that the transcapital ligament becomes thinner and thinner, and kind of merges with the defecation of the palm itself, and that is where the distal branches start off. And a lot of times, the distal edge may not be very distinct, and so you need to be very careful as you go distally here. At this part, it will be quite thick, but as you go distally, you start getting the distal branches, you start getting the palmar arch, superficial palmar arch. So all these stru vital structures start coming in. So distally, as you come in, be careful. and your incision should become rather your dissection should become more and more delicate and pick up the tissue with your forceps and then just cut through that and once you start seeing the fat popping out there that is the you know area where you need to stop and be very careful because that's where the digital nerves are coming off from the medial nerve itself and also you have the superficial palmar arch so this basically completes your dissection here you don't really have to explore the tunnel most of the times but in case there is doubt you need to do that so this is the uh, actual thickness of the transcapital ligament here and you also need to release the uh, forearm fascia the the forearm fascia gently flex the wrist there and uh, under we should make sure that Anil sir, please unmute yourself. Sorry. So, in case you want to extend the incision and you want to do uh, 
uh, tenosynovectomy here uh, because this was a patient with rheumatoid. So you would explore the tunnel and see if there are any other swellings inside. Sometimes the ganglion could be there. Then you increase the incision here at this point. And as I said, go towards the ulnar side here so that you avoid the recurrent branch here at this point. Okay, don't have to explore it. And then once that is done, you can do a good uh, thorough job of your tenosynovectomy. Tenosynovectomy rheumatoid patients helps in reducing the load of the immune uh, this is the, the immune tissue itself. So they give they get a lot of relief, pain relief with this. You can send it for biopsy if it is a suspected case of tuberculosis or any of these things. So this is one way of getting those uh, uh, tissue sample. Endoscopic release can be done using one or two portals. They say early return to work because there is absolutely no scar in the palm. That is my at least rationale of using endoscopic carpal tunnel release. Better improvement in grip strength, less incidence of pain. All these are in the first six to weeks, six weeks to three months. Later on, all most of your results are same. It has a steep learning curve, requires conversion to open if distal end of the transverse carpal ligament is not visualized. So very, very low threshold for conversion should be there. This is a basic instrumentation. You do have a specific set of instruments. This is called a synovial dissector. These are the dilators, different the three sizes of dilators. This is your blade, endoscopic blade. This is the endoscopic system itself the, with the trigger here. This is a scope. And the classic uh, regular other, uh, light source and camera for your arthroscopy, what you use can be used for this. So this is a single portal system which I use regularly. And this blade has a this, this has a light source and the blade which comes together like this. And this is the way we assemble the whole thing. So the blade is put here and tightened at this with the help of this knob. And uh, one, if you press the trigger, the blade comes out here at this point. <clears throat> and uh, that is how uh, the, the transoscopal ligament is cut uh, through this with the help of this blade here. And as I said, you can use your regular uh, camera and light source, which will be used for arthroscopy in any arthroscopy in our unit. You can use that. The same thing, the, the, this system can be used both sides. You don't have to you know, change your place. You can sh just shift your hands. And basically, if you turn the whole thing uh, opposite side like this, you can use it for the other hand. So all you need to do is to rotate the scope and uh, change the direction of the blade itself. So that is how you use this. And the landmarks here is a little different, obviously, from you basically the incision stays at the wrist itself. Uh, this is uh, what I'm showing is just for the beginners, especially, uh, where slightly bigger incision, uh, with, you have the FCR and FCU, but otherwise you basically go between the FCR and Palmaris longus uh, as and when you get your expertise, but otherwise, in the beginning, at least make a big incision, slightly big incision <clears throat> between these two tendons. And then you have your Pisiform as your uh, landmark here. This is for the Kaplan slides I'm talking about. You have the hook of the hammock, just one centimeter distal to the uh, uh, Pisiform, and then you draw your Kaplan's interval there. Uh, that is just to tell that don't go beyond that distal edge of that Kaplan slice. So that is what uh, is, is basically the message there. And uh, that's the junction at this point. So your incision is along the wrist crease. <clears throat> uh, that's what the manual says. But I usually go in between the wrist crease because the wound doesn't move. A lot of um, wound movement doesn't happen. The scar movement doesn't happen. Once you go here, uh, between the palmaris longus here at this point, uh, you have the deep fascia coming in. Okay. And then you take a small uh, facial flap uh, in the deep fascia here. Uh, you don't really have to take a face. Nowadays, I don't take a flap like this. I just make a transverse cut and remove a part of the fascia there. So absolutely no issues with that. And then once you identify the, the nerve is just behind, uh, behind this, <clears throat> And once you identify that, you start uh, dilating the tunnel itself here. This is a synovial dissector. So if there's any additions inside, any kind of synovial hypertrophy, just clears up the area for the dilator to come in. This is the dilator which comes in. We need to go to go from the ulnar side like this. We need to feel the hamlet as we go towards that. <clears throat> and uh, there's a hamlet. Actually, it's called a hamlet finder, the last one. And... Uh, 
basically dilate the tunnel. At this point, you can also make out that the other tunnel is very tight. Some of the patients do have a very tight tunnel and your scope doesn't go very easily and don't make sure that you don't push it because you cause a lot of uh, you know, stretch of the nerve itself. But otherwise, gently hold the wrist in its a dorsiflex position and the, and the scope goes in very nicely here at this point. And once you go in, you start seeing on your monitor, you will start seeing these transverse fibers of the transverse carpal ligament itself. So that classical picture has to be seen uh, during your, you know, as you enter there. Uh, so these transverse fibers have to be seen. There could be sometimes fluid, sometimes synovitis. But then if you feel uh, it's not looking in, in a normal uh, anatomy, then you should, maybe you're in the wrong position. Sometimes you might be entering Guyan's canal also. So make sure you see this transverse fibers here. See the distal edge of the tunnel properly from from the top, I'm just pushing my thumb there. So that is a fat which is the, the distal edge of the tunnel itself. So once you see the clear edge, press the trigger so the blade comes out there. And then you do the dissection and pull your blade up. So your, the nerve is be, below your, your scope itself. So the nerve is not here. Only the ligament is at the top. And uh, so you just have to cut the ligament, incise the ligament there through and through. Okay. So a couple of passes might be required and you will get the uh, uh, distal third once it's, uh, so that is the palmar is is being seen from the underneath now, rather than from the top, what we saw during the open dissection. So that's the distal edge, uh, which is cut off now. And once it is released uh, completely, what happens is the fat prolapses. So that is the, so that's part of the distal fiber still there, which I'm cutting through now. And, uh, once that is done, uh, the fat prolapses and that tells you that you are, there's a cut edge there, which is clearly visible. So you don't really explore the tunnel with this scope. You just have to incise and come out. That's very, very important. Sometimes you don't see the distal edge like this. There'll be a lot of fluid here, poor definition. These are the times when you do need to abort the uh, uh, procedure itself. And you can do it under valent. This was done under valent and local. Any of these can be done and checked for the positions. Uh, one word about uh, patients who come with very bad hyper, uh, you know, wasting of the thinar muscle here, ABP especially. So we do the Kamitz procedure, which is primarily a tendon transfer with the palmar is longest tendon here, along with the a strip of the palmar fascia itself is taken out. And then see the amount of uh, the, the swelling of the nerve and the constriction of the nerve here. And you need to release the deep branch, especially the thina branch here for these patients. You need to go in a little and make sure you release the thina branch also, the digital branch. And that is the, the tendon uh, which has been harvested. And once that's done, you basically, this is one of the tendon transfers which doesn't go with the principle that is a pulley here. It goes directly here. So it's not a very classical tendon transfer, but we want some activity to start immediately for the patient uh, till for the nerve to recover. So that's why the Kamich procedure is done when there's absolute uh, gross wasting and motor weakness for the patients here in these patients. And once that's done, it's it's like any other, uh, you, you suture it to the APB here and to the capsule of the joint itself and to the extensor expansion. Uh, that is how it is uh, sutured here. And uh, that should be the final position. And so patient starts working immediately. So the nerve release is now basically more for sensory kind of a, a recovery. Uh, we don't really want the motor recovery to happen by this. This can be taken care of by this CAMIS procedure. Mobilization, we usually put a splint for a week and continue the night splint for three weeks and scar massage and hand therapy. Scar hypertrophy, tenderness, pillar pain, these are common. Sometimes there could be injury to nerve and tendon, especially many open incisions, which might lead to CRPS2 and persistent pain and recurrence. So diagnosis is predominantly clinical and investigation is to know the altered anatomy and physiology with your NCV and ultrasound. Treatment is purely based on patient symptom severity and complications are uncommon, but quite can be quite devastating when it happens. Thank you so much. Anil sir will continue with CRPS. Oh. Okay. I request you. Is it seen the presentation? 
Yes, sir. It's a, it's a scene, sir. It's a visible. Okay. So all these procedures, what we talked about today, uh, whether trigger, decoherence, carpal tunnel, any of these finally can end up with uh, LCRPS. So, and that's the, the bane of hand surgery or one of the curse of hand surgery. And if you have a patient with CRPS, uh, a lot of times we are hand surgeons, we do know that how difficult it is uh, for these uh, patients to be given a good relief. And generally, this is how the patient comes to us. This is a classic uh, case of a malignant distal radius fracture treated with plaster and then comes here. And you see a lot of times these kind of swelling here, these kind of color difference, especially. So you know something is happening here, especially related to uh, vasomotor kind of etiology here. And this was, again, if you take the x-ray, you see this periarticular kind of osteoporosis in these patients. And uh, the movements are always difficult for these patients, quite painful, very stiff. And they're very unhappy patients, uh, generally because one, they either they might have been treated with plaster, they have an injury, plaster was put, or they have a problem like carpal tunnel surgery was done. So they have already had a problem. And then on top of that, you have something again developing like this after the treatment. Movements will be restricted initially very bad, badly, you know, and quite painful also. That, that's the problem. The main component is the pain. So it's quite a debilitating, painful condition. And it involves a lot of structures, sensory, motor, autonomic, including bone. And the limb dysfunction generally goes on to psychological distress. That is what happens in a lot of these patients. They keep going around with many, many, uh, you know, uh, practitioners. Absolutely no major, uh, you know, physical findings except what I showed. So the Budapest criteria still is, is a very relevant one for us to diagnose, uh, I mean, CRPS, because... You might have plaster disease in these patients. You might have, you know, stiffness because of immobilization. But for us to brand them as CRPS, we need to have something very specific or very objective. So presence of a continuing pain, which is disproportionate to an inciting event, is very important. Uh, must report at least one symptom in three or more of the following four categories. I'll just show you that. And at least one sign. So the categories are either sensory, which is hyperalgesia or allodynia. And vasomotor, which is temperature asymmetry or skin color changes, pseudomotor, edema, sweating changes, and sweating asymmetry, and motor, which is basically decreased range of motion or motor dysfunction. It could be weakness, tremor, and trophic changes in the skin, hair, and nails. So at least one symptom in three or more of these four categories, and at least one sign in two or more of the four categories. So this is how we score them. And there's no other diagnosis that better explains the symptoms and signs. At the end of the day, that is how we need to convince that this patient has CRPS and not anything else. Because the management completely changes once you brand them as CRPS. Prevention is the most important thing. Uh, all we talked about, about immobilization, elevation, all these early mobilization, all these are very, very important. Physical and occupational therapy, pharmacological and procedures, invasive, and patient counseling and psychological intervention. That is very, very important in these situations. Commonly used drugs could be right from paracetamol, NSAIDs, muscle relaxants, antidepressants, anticonvulsants, steroids. Any of these things are used very, very commonly and rampantly. And what is the evidence for this? And it, it will be surprising to see that absolutely no evidence of paracetamol of the degree of pain control achieved by NSAIDs in CRPS patient uh, CRPS-1 patients. No evidence that anticonvulsants such as carbamazepine, phenytoin, and antidepressants work for CRPS. If patients has developed problem, psychological issues and all, maybe yes, but otherwise absolutely don't give them uh, you know, antidepressants and things like that as a first line. Absolutely no evidence of muscle relaxants. A lot of patients are put on muscle relaxants for a long time. Absolutely no evidence for these things. Okay. Corticosteroids may have a positive effect on CRPS, but we don't know the duration. No study tells you the duration. People have used from, I'm quoting, these are RCTs and systematic reviews I'm quoting. Prednisolone could be from 30 mg to 100 mg people have used, right from one to two weeks to up to three months people have used. So there is no definite uh, dose or duration of this. This is a March 2022 systematic review. It talks about effectiveness of prednisolone and it tells that they, they may be effective in elevating the CRPS symptoms. But then obviously, like any other systematic review, it ends telling that higher level of evidence, 
you know, all those things, are randomized control trials, all should be done. A lot of times we can't really do. We don't have so many patients to do RCTs and we, we really don't know how this can be solved in terms of management. So there could be a, a, a positive effect of uh, uh, steroids. But bisphosphonates, if you see, they have a very strong evidence. Again, this is an August 2022 uh, symptomatic, systematic review I'm showing. And it tells that there is a good evidence for, especially for, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, bisphosphonates. Uh, and it tells that bisphosphonates basically uh, act by inhibiting bone resorption. So this, it's not acting on the CRPS per se. The bone demineralization, uh, which ha which uh, leads to a lot of pain and edema, that's where the bisphosphonates come in, and they can be given IV or oral. They have very strong evidence for that. Ketamine infusions, again, I'm giving you a 2021 20, October systematic review here, and it tells that there is a good amount of uh, ketamine infusion may be useful in the form of treatment for patients with no significant pain relief with other conservative measures. And we have been using ketamine infusion with the help of uh, our anesthetists and sometimes even with the palliative medicine nowadays. And it's it's quite encouraging for this. Vitamin C, most studies support this. It, it's basically an antioxidant. That's the way it acts. And again, this is a 2021 the systematic review I'm giving you. And it tells, especially for prevention, it's a very prophylactic use. Uh, if you have a dislocated fracture, you operated or you put them on a plaster, 500,000 mg daily dose for 45 to 50, that is the first six weeks is good enough and there's a very strong level one evidence for vitamin C. Other techniques for prevention, regional anesthetic techniques for brachial plexus blockade, epidural anesthesia, stellate blocks and uh, multimodal analgesia and also salmon calcitonin also is, is also can prevent a relapse of CRPS. These are for preventive measures. One of the things uh, we should know is what is called as a mirror therapy and uh, described by an Indian here, aims to create an illusion of normal. So this is one of the major pillars for occupational therapy uh, for when we, which we use, uh, in, especially in our department. It creates an illusion of normality in the affected limb and involves concealing the affected limb behind the mirror. And the non-affected limb is positioned so that its reflection is superimposed to where the affected limb should be. And so the brain is basically tricked here. The brain has been shown to prioritize visual input over proprioceptive input. So what happens is there is what is called as a graded motor imagery, which happens here, where participants see a series of photographic flashcards and they're asked to identify whether the depiction is of left or right lip. What is basically the theory here is that the brain prioritizes uh, you know, the limb, which is always painful and more and more signals are generated. There's a reorganization in the cortical brain and that's why the pain goes on continuously present. It's, it's a cycle and that cycle needs to be break, uh, broken rather. So participants imagine moving the affected limb into the position demonstrated in the photograph. So they give different activities and patient tries to do that. And finally, the mirror therapy comes where both the limbs are moved to adapt some simple postures. So there's a lot of evidence again here. This is uh, uh, evidence strongly suggesting that this motor imagery should be used to reduce the CRPS patient. What we do in our setup is basically based on the RCT, we give vitamin C whenever we know that there could be a problem with the patient. Uh, and then sometimes we do a regional anesthetic block. But most importantly, when the patient comes, we send them for our uh, physical therapy, which basically is edema management, contrast bath, splinting of deformities, assisted mobilization of shoulder and hand, and finally mirror therapy. And the mirror therapy works like this. So basically this is a box here. There's a mirror on one side, the hand goes here, the mirror is on this side, the, the therapist, therapist sits on this side, patient sits on this side, and this is how, uh, you know, uh, the mirror is on and where the patient uses this particularly to place the hand in this box. Uh, this is the whole setup. Anybody can do this in your setup. Uh, it's a very easy way of doing this. And what is happening is now, this is the injured hand, which has got the CRPS, okay? <clears throat> lot of pain, lot of swelling, grip is reduced, lot of, you know, difficulty for the patient to hold objects. This is what happens, okay? So what it does is now, patient is seeing the normal limb now from on the mirror, okay? The injured one is inside here. So page, now the brain thinks that this is a normal hand 
understand. So once that happens, you see the grip is much better now with this patient. Okay. So the brain is tricked that this normal hand is the injured hand here by looking at the patient and patient is looking at the mirror. So this is the basic uh, way the mirror therapy works. And uh, it, it's given us a lot of uh, good results in a lot of these patients. Patients are quite happy with the amount of improvement they achieve with this. There are, uh, you know, stretch boards like this which we use uh, for getting rid of the stiffness. There are instruments like this which the occupational therapy is used to increase the range of motion. So the stretch board is basically used to with the specs like this so that gradually the range of motion is increased with these patients. So this is shifted in different positions as and when they gain the range of motion here. And these are the ones which are used to you know, uh, get uh, range of motion, inflammation, and supination. Sorry about this video, it's just turned. And also for the shoulder mobilization. We do give pregabalin twice daily, NSH sometimes, vitamin C and calcium. Uh, we use bisphosphonates orally for about eight weeks. Otherwise, we give an IV pamidronate 60 mg. And of course, with the help of the anesthetist, we give ketamine sometimes. So it's all a graded thing. It's not that everybody gets these. Once the first therapy and everything is done and NSAs don't work, then we go to the next level of bisphosphonates and ketamine. Sometimes local block uh, for three weeks or stellate back uh, ganglion blocks or intravenous regional anesthesia is given. But if one block doesn't work, means that generally the response is poor, they don't really do well. So these are all kept, the invasive procedures are kept for later procedures. So there is an increasing evidence for the role of CNS in the development or maintenance of CRPS. That's what is the theory now. Symptoms are basically due to changes of the cortical processing, which I told. And there is a neuroinflammatory process. The entire neural axis is inflamed. That's what people tell. And focusing on central modulation connecting to the clinical practice is growing in popularity, especially things like mirror therapy and graded motor imaging. All these have to be used for us to get rid of this very devastating kind of complication. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Anil, sir, uh, for nice presentations. Nice. I request Dr. Abhijit to please uh, take over because there is a resurgence of Awaj. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, um, very quickly, uh, I want to acknowledge and thank uh, Professor Anil Bhatt. Dr. Ajit Tiwari, Dr. Kamle sir, and Karan, and of course, uh, Dr. Karane sir, uh, the Ortho TV team also, uh, and the IOA West Zone for uh, giving us the opportunity to put this webinar together. I sincerely hope that uh, the audience has uh, enjoyed um, this webinar as much as we did being a part of it. Um, Outpatient procedures in hand surgery are very common, and we thought this would be a good uh, platform to discuss this very interesting topic. And I think that uh, speakers have done uh, more than justice to the talks assigned to them. They were very lucid. They were very uh, clear. And uh, I, I'm sure that everyone recognizes the time and effort that our uh, faculty puts in, in, put in getting these talks to you. So I encourage more and more people to be a part of this uh, uh, series. Uh, we're going to have two more webinars coming up on the following two weekends, uh, wherein uh, one of the uh, Sundays, I think we'll be discussing soft tissue injuries and then uh, bony injuries and fractures of the hand and the wrist. And uh, I'm sure they will be exciting and uh, engaging as well for our uh, audience. Uh, do not hesitate to send in your questions uh, even after the webinar is over on personal emails or on different uh, platforms. We'll be happy to answer them. Uh, once again, thank you very much. And um, I think we can call it a day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Poonam, madam, can we... Uh, stop the webinar now.